In future generations, our love story they will tell. You're still pretty as a picture, just like our wedding day. You've always been my faithful friend through years of work and play. I can't believe my luck to earn the love I found so true. Angels smile, my faith was sealed the day that I met you. Angel smile, my faith was sealed the day that I met you. You are listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Good morning and welcome to Old Town Cleveland here on Whoop FM 99.9 where you go to the uh, internet, not the interstate, the internet at www.whoopfm.com. You can call us this morning here at 614-5553. Welcome my special co-host today. This isn't Debbie, Ken. Uh, Debbie's in in Dalton at the Georgia, Tennessee dirt track reunion so it, all these old drivers and we're working on a documentary now on the cleveland speedway so she's down recording all the old drivers and the lies that they've got we've got a whole crew down there today so i'm very fortunate to have my former good sports I, i'm not on good sports he's still on good sports and <laughs> thing arnold tarfley good morning arnold good morning ron how you doing i'm doing great you got any good things going on all just work as usual and hoping to dodge all the raindrops today. I, I heard that you have talked about me on Good Sports. Yeah, we have discussed uh, some dieting and hot dog uh, yeah, goings on. I, I heard you said that I was in spring training for the hot dogs for the football season coming up. That, that, that's what I said. I represent that. <laughs> <laughs> Our special guest today is Mr. Ken Rush, the Executive Director of the Ducktown Museum. It's the Ducktown Museum. Ducktown Co- Basin Museum. Ducktown Basin. I'll get it all right. In Copper Hill or Ducktown. Ducktown. It's in Ducktown. So we're going to find out about where Ducktown and Isabella and all that is here before we hear, leave today. Okay. We, we've had some great conversations this morning, and uh, I'm sitting here going just uh, – uh, I thought I knew a lot about it, but Ken, goodness gracious, but he's getting like me. He can't remember all the names mm. anymore. Just <laughs> we, we go – you know, it used to be right over there. I can show you where it is. But good morning, Ken. How you doing? I'm doing well. Glad to be here. Um, the museum. Uh, first, before we go on, we want to talk about the, just the museum just for a minute. Sure. Uh, celebrating 30 years? 35 years. 35 years. Yes. Well, great. Yes. We were we chartered and organized in 1978, so this is our 35th year. How, being, long, how long have you been involved in it? Be 24 years this fall. You almost know how to get there now, don't you? Almost. Yeah. You live here in Cleveland. Uh, North of Cleveland. North of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. The, uh, so tell us about the museum. What, what, if people's never been there and, and, you know, I I repeat, well, I didn't know they had a museum there. Well, we're going to fix that today. Tell, tell them where it is. Sure. Uh, the museum is located, uh, in Ducktown, uh, just off of highway 68, uh, when you're coming into the basin, regardless of which calendar point now, we actually have the uh, the brown 
uh, state markers that say Ducktown Basin Museum State Historic Site. Uh, the museum property is the Burra Burra Mine Site, and that is owned by the state of Tennessee. We're a state-owned historic site under the Historical Commission. And the Ducktown Basin Museum is a nonprofit that administers the site for the state of Tennessee. And we're primarily, uh, people call us a mining museum, but our, our mission is to interpret and preserve the uh, history of the basin communities which is very closely tied in, tied in to the mining and uh, industrial operations that went on in the communities for better than 100 years. It's a great little museum. Have you, yeah. have you been, Arnold? Yes, it is. I've been. I need to get back up there and take my wife. Yeah. She's never been yet. Oh, well, yeah. and what's the charge to get in? It is $5 for adults, 4 for seniors. Uh, children ages 12 to 17 are a couple of bucks, and under that is a dollar. So okay. it's very affordable. Very affordable. Is, 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 it very, is there a little film when you get there? Yes, we have about an 11-minute uh, intro film that we will show you that will give you a nice overview from the beginning of mining in the 1840s up till close to present day. And so it's uh, very interesting, and you can uh, – now, if, if when you get there on the top of the hill, it's up on top of the hill, right. and you look out over the fence, tell us what that big hole is out there. There's actually a collapse into a portion of the Burra Burra mine that is visible from what we call our overlook. Mm -hmm. uh, the property we're located on was one of the working mines, but it was surface headquarters for all mining. So the main museum building is housed in what used to be the engineering and geology offices mm -hmm. for Tennessee Copper and their successors' mining operations. And some of the buildings on site were shops and, and storage sheds for the mine department equipment, regardless of which mine it was being used at. And then some of our buildings were just in support of mining at Burra. And, of course, the mining in the basin was deep shaft. Uh, a couple of the mines went over 3,000 foot in depth. Uh, Burra Burra only went 2,400 foot. So we're, we're not quite the, the deepest. Oh, wow. Uh, but we have 10 buildings on 17 acres, and it's also a National Register of Historic Places site as well. So Now, um, I think you've been on before, and uh, every time you come, I just learn more and more about the area there. Uh, uh, I think you told me that the – the copper mining, you didn't have as many cave-ins as because of the rock structure was different. Was is that, is that true? That's that's correct, and and I should say that I have a history degree. So what I'm what I'm telling is what I've picked up from talking to the men that worked in the mm -hmm. mines and talking to the engineers and geologists. But uh, we're talking about hard rock mining, which is not typical for the southeast. Most of the mining in our part of the country is usually coal or some other soft mineral where you're dealing with uh, what they would call unconsolidated ground. Uh, in hard rock, it's just that. It's usually strong enough to bear the weight. And the areas like off our overlook that did cave to the surface, they were anticipating it months in advance. So they just stopped going under that section. Mm -hmm. So normally the, uh, the caves, when they did cave to the surface, and there's quite a few of those in the basin, they gave, if not months, weeks warning. Uh, the biggest risk to the men was what they call loose ground or balk ground, which is just a small piece scabbing or scaling away, which, you know, a piece the size of a softball is going to weigh several pounds. And, you know, when you get up into the basketball, you're talking 20, 30 pounds. And, you know, obviously if that falls between the three of us, well, that was a close call. If it hits one of us, it's going to be a little bit different Even the hard story. hat don't help a lot. It it. Doesn't help a lot when you yeah. get that much of I mean, gravity and inertia. It may not crack your head, but your neck's stuck It's probably going to drive you down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Arnold, you had uh, a grandfather that lived and worked in the mines? My grandfather lived in Ducktown. He worked in the Burr Burr and Isabella mines predominantly most of his career, which was cut short by the sulfur explosion, mm -hmm. I think, in what, 42, late 42? 43, 43 I believe. 40, yeah, uh, I believe it was January of 43. Yeah, because uh, in... You know, he was injured in that explosion, and one of the he was actually one of the last men brought out alive, according to what my father sa has told me. That's where I knew his name from. Yes. Uh, I'm actually uh, named after him. Okay. My first name and last name, Arnold Tarpley. I, it, it's kind of funny. I go up into the Polk County areas in years past when I worked for the state, and I'd run up on an old-timer and everything. He'd look at me real funny and say, I know that name. I said, my grandfather was named this. I remember him. <laughs> mm -hmm. It it, yeah, it was a fun thing, fun thing to go in and be able to talk to some of the old timers there. Right. They remembered him. They tell me some stories. Of course, stories Dad told too. Right. So how many mines at 
the peak was operating up there? Well, there were nine separate deposits in Polk County, Tennessee, and then there were three additional deposits in across the line in Fannin County, Georgia. Uh, the ones in, in Georgia were, were quite small compared to the ones in Tennessee, and two of those were worked out by the Civil War. Uh, Sally Jane and Mobile were both worked out by the Civil War. Number 20 was uh, reopened during the First World War when the price of copper went up so much. Uh, but within Polk County, you had, these are the names of the deposits. Now you had Burra Burra, London, East Tennessee, Eureka, Boyd, Mary, Polk County, Callaway, and Cherokee, or yeah, Cherokee. And sometimes, especially in the 1800s, you had multiple owners on each deposit. You might own part of it, and I might own part of it. So there were sometimes numerous mines and mining companies working the same deposit. You might be on one side, and I was on the other. Those began to consolidate by the Civil War, and, and by the time of the Civil War, you were down to three companies owning the, the mines in the basin. Uh, when you get into the 20th century, it consolidates even more. You have two companies owning them at the turn of the century. And by 1936, Tennessee Copper owned all the mines in the basin from that point forward. Did, was there concerns about gases like there would be in other mines? Uh, again, hard rock mining, you typically do not encounter the, the gas. Uh, it, it was something they found on occasion. The accident uh, that we were talking about was a dust explosion. The sulfur dust actually mm -hmm. ignited. And that was the largest accident in terms of fatalities and men injured that we had in the basin. Uh, How big was that? Nine men ended up dying. Eight outright and one within a few days. And then there was probably two dozen more that suffered various amounts of uh, smoke inhalation. It, you know, scarred their lungs. A lot of mm -hmm. them had problems with breathing. Uh, because of the sulfur and the and the smoke uh, being high in sulfur, um, so there was at one time Callaway Mine was declared as a gassy mine by the Bureau of Mines. Uh, uh, it wasn't because of a fatality, but they had an incident where they encountered a pocket of methane, and uh, what they had to do was keep it isolated from the other mines in the basin. They they were tunnels that connected the mines together by the 20th century. And they had to have doors constructed that that you would close when you were going to Callaway. You closed the door behind mm -hmm. you, basically, and and kept it on a separate ventilation system so its air wasn't allowed to mingle in with the other air. But again, in hard rock mining, that's not a typical problem. Uh, it's just different geology. Geology of coal is the same as methane. They're normally found in the same areas. The uh, <clears throat> I imagine uh, calling it hard rock. It's harder to dig then, right? Uh, it was, and, and digging is probably not the correct term okay. because Blasting. you had to drill it and then load mm -hmm. explosives and blast it. Yeah. yeah, You didn't break it by hitting it with a pick or, or pecking on it with a hammer. They they would drill holes and load explosives into those and then shoot it down. Yeah, that was my grandfather's job was a driller. He, he swung the sledgehammer. Okay. <laughs> okay. So at first it was dr with a sledgehammer drive of... Well, it was long hand, hand, mm -hmm, hand drilling, and then you began to see machine drills come in by the 1870s, but it wasn't until the early part of the 20th century that you went totally to machine drilling. And these are uh, run on compressed air. They're pneumatic, yeah. and they're, mm -hmm. they're like hammers. So it's not rotating. It's hammering. Yeah. Now, did uh, I've lost my train of thought there, uh, Okay. which is not unusual, though. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get down 3,000 feet? You walk? Well, you would sink a shaft, and you'd ride a cage, just like an elevator. Instead of taking you up in a tall building, this takes you down in the ground. So uh, you had a specialized crew that would do the shaft sinking, and uh, once that was completed, you're putting in rails and guides, and, and the elevator is running literally just like an elevator in a building on these guides and rails. But they would lower you to whatever level you're working, and then you would get off and work. Some of the mines would have two shafts. You would have a man shaft that just was putting personnel in and out of the mine, and then you had a production shaft that was for putting equipment in the mine and bringing ore out. Uh, normally when the equipment went down, it never came back. Uh, most of it was outsized, and you carried it down in pieces, and once it was reassembled underground, that's pretty much where it stayed. Uh, Burra Burra had a dual-use shaft, so they had a 
what they called the cage that they would put on to lower the men in and out of the mine. And then once they got one shift out and the next shift in, they took the cage off and put the skip on. And the rest of the shift, it hauled ore to the surface. So, But it's just like taking an elevator, except this one's taking you down. But there's only one floor. Yeah. Well, there's what? multiple floors. The, the What they refer to as the, levels. They're way down there, though. Well, the bottom's way down there. <laughs> yeah, yes, okay. sir. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, how yeah. big was the rooms when you got down in there to, to mine? Were they, it just wasn't all tunnels. I mean, somewhere you right. had to start extracting the ore. How big was a room? Well, they would create time? what were called stopes. And again, as time and equipment changed, these stopes enlarged. Uh, in the 1850s and 60s and 70s, they were doing what was called underhand stoping, and, and they would actually drill overhead. The ore deposit, you have to think of it, it's vertical. Rather than being horizontal, it's vertical. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it has thickness as well. And in some places, these ore deposits were more than 100 foot thick. So the stopes that they created, and, and I'm referring to the 20th century now, were generally about 60 foot wide and could be as thick as the ore, which could be more than 100 foot in that dimension. And then depending on the angle of the slope of the deposit, it could be several hundred foot vertical. So there were stopes underground that if, if we could carry a little helicopter down, we could fly it around in there. They, they were Some of them were very large, some of them were not so large. There were other areas where the ore deposit wasn't as thick and the angle wasn't as steep. And, and you know, they might only be 60 by 50 foot and 100 or 200 foot vertical. That's a pretty big hole down in 3,000 feet. Though. Yes. I mean, Arnold, you said your grandfather, after they got the whole thing, that they put dynamite in it. Did you stay down in the mine when they blew it up or did you get out? You would retreat to what they referred to as a shooting station. So there were yeah. certain areas that you would go back to. And, and, you know, there's a lot of different jobs going on. While there's guys drilling and developing over here, there's other guys doing production over yeah. here. So but it seemed to be loud. It was loud, and most of them suffered hearing damage. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Hello, Ron. Hey, Ella. How you doing? I had to go to the hospital last night. You had to go to the doctor last night? The hospital. Oh, what's wrong? I have a kidney infection, infection and an ear infection. Well, now, the kidney infection, you know, drink a little bit more beer, and that will help that clear up. I know. <laughs> that just, that just, you just hate that you're going to have to drink more beer, aren't you? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I, got some, I got some medicine for it. <laughs> oh, well, we hope you get to feeling better, so I don't guess you're going to go out in this rain today. No, I ain't going nowhere. I didn't even go to Pokies last night. Uh-oh, well, she's sick. I mean, yeah. She's sick because she didn't go to Pokemon. Yeah, she, she's bad sick. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, uh, well, I just, I wore Debbie at this morning. She's down in Dalton at a filming some stuff at a, a dirt track convention. Reunion, I guess you call it. There are a bunch of old guys who used to run around on the dirt racing, and they're going to tell lies. So I don't think there'll be a true story told anywhere down there today. <laughs> All right, Miss Ella. I hope you get to feeling better. Oh, yeah, I do too. <laughs> well, just go in there and lay down and take you a nap. I already did. <laughs> oh, I can take three or four of those, though. <laughs> All right. All thank, right. thank you, Miss Ella. Bye-bye. Now, you know Miss Ella's sick if she didn't go drinking last night. Yeah. There's, there's something wrong there. Hey, hey, Ken, she's a cougar, too, now. She likes you younger men. Oh, okay. Okay, so, yeah, she's 73, 74. It's nice of you to call me a younger man, yeah, by well, the way. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm getting older, so I have to call everybody younger now. <laughs> Good morning, you live on Old Town Cleveland. Hey, this is Carmen, and I just wanted to make sure I heard that correctly. You could put a helicopter down there? In extreme cases, and I'm talking about a smaller helicopter, but, but some of the stopes would have been 60 by 100 and then several hundred foot vertical. So we're talking about a pretty large opening that you create underground. Well, the helicopters I've been around cause a lot of wind. Wouldn't that cause a bunch of dust? Well, I was just speaking in, in terms of the size. Yeah, Obviously, don't you don't want to fly it down there. Yes, it would be a big problem with the dust. I was just trying to give you a, an idea of how large of an area was underground. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you for mm -hmm. time. Bye-bye. Probably wasn't the best analogy. Well, you could put use. a tank in there, couldn't you? You could put a tank, tank in there. And several tanks in mm -hmm. the room that you big. You could. Uh, that's uh, 
it, it's just hard to imagine that you go down 3,000 feet or 2,400 feet or mm -hmm. two or 200 feet and have a room mm -hmm. that's, you know, some of them getting close to a basketball court. Oh, yes. You know, yes. You, you could definitely play basketball definitely there. Definitely play basketball. Wow, that, that's pretty big. Good morning, you live on Old Town Cleveland. Oh, yes. Uh, I, uh, next, uh, I was wanting to put on there next week is uh, Postal Food Drive. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, and I'm wanting to remind the people to put their food out next Saturday. Just put it out at your mailbox? Yeah, in front of the mailbox. And, te and tell them what they do with that food. Excuse me? T tell everybody what they do with the food. Well, they take it, They uh, the postal drive picks it up, takes it to the post office, and then the people are from the church, different churches, comes in and gets food, and uh, they just, they deliver it out to people that, you know, it's in need, that's sick, can't work. Well, it's, it's, a great, it's a great project, and I always like that it's done earlier in the year. So everybody wants to do it at Christmas or Thanksgiving. Yes. And if you're hungry in April, <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, you're, you're hungry year-round. So, you know, it's a great project. And uh, uh, so uh, just put, your ba uh, put it out, hang it on a bag there on the mailbox, and people will pick it up. On the front of the mailbox, some, some, uh, some of the postmen said that they had a little hard time. They put it in the back, and they had to get out get out of their vehicle yeah. and go around and get it. But they said it'd be awful good if they could just reach and get it where they're sitting. Put it right there on the front. And yeah, if you know, you, they're volunteering their time. I mean, of course, you know, they're picking the mail up anyway, but still it takes time. To oh, it. sure it does. You know. And everything that's done in this is volunteer. Right. They bring it in and... You know, different churches. There's quite a few churches that uh, you know participates in it, and uh, we have a we have a thing at each. We go around each each one. You know, draws see who's going to be first, get the first food that comes in. Mm -hmm. That's good. And we just go down the numbers, and and it's all worked out good. It, what if you have a PO box? Do you have a place you can drop food off at the post office? Yes, you can. You could bring it around the back. Okay, yeah, well. You sure can. I appreciate you mentioning that. I forgot that. Well, I, I have a PO box, and I said I wanted to donate, and I didn't know where to take it, but I'll we'll get some to you. You did this last year, didn't you, Ron? Yes, sir, I did. Yeah, and you did a good job. I appreciate it. Well, you, make sure you call us next Saturday morning, too, to remind everybody. Yeah, if you will, on up in your program. You all do a good job, you and Nancy. But on up your program, if you would, you know, kindly announce it because, you know, some people might not catch you then and they, and they go start listening at you later. So. Oh, they do. We'll mention it again. Okay, Ron. We sure appreciate you, buddy. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's always glad to help these people out there. So, uh, big rooms. That just free. Now, uh, on Facebook this week, uh, I started, I always post a couple of pictures about mm -hmm. what we're talking about this week. And I posted a picture of what looked like the moon except it was red dirt <laughs> and and it was a great picture because it you could see for it looks like miles and it was red dirt and no ridges and things like that and there's not a tree a blade of grass a bush <laughs> an animal or anything like that and some guy wrote there he said that's where he used to hide when he snuck out of school he'd hide in them gullies I said, well, when I snuck out, I had a bush to hide behind. <laughs> so it was a little, I think it was harder. And then people talk about sliding up and down on those mm -hmm. old hills. But literally for for a long time, Copper Hill, and, and I remember even into the 60s when I was a little boy growing up there in Arnold, you, I'm sure you went up in the area there. Oh, about, about every weekend I was and, up in that area. Uh, they, even 60s, 70s, there's still no trees, nothing. And, of course, we didn't know why it was, but... It, it was one of those mysterious places to go. <laughs> and my wife says, big deal. We land on the moon. We say that ever, all the time up here in Copper Hill. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, the, we see no trees and stuff like that. Right. Um, people quite often ask, you know, and, and I think the, it started as early in the 50s. and th The 50s to the 1900s probably when most of the damage was done. Is yes. That crazy? Well, tell people why it looked like that. What happened? Okay. Um, Mining began in the basin in 1850, and uh, when the mines opened, uh, there was not a road yet built into the basin. There was not a railroad close to the basin, and the early mining companies were cutting the timber 
and converting a lot of it to charcoal to f run their furnaces with and to power their boilers that were running their steam engines that was powering a lot of the equipment. And then, of course, you needed also uh, timber to go for houses because you, you didn't have communities there prior to the mines opening. And then by 1850, you had 1,000 people working there. And there's no EPA? Uh, no EPA. Okay. But, uh, you know, the bottom line was... Between 1850 and 1878, every tree standing for 50 square miles was cut for fuel. Wow. And on top of that, go ahead. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Um, Ron, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted to ask a question. Go ahead. <clears throat> Once that you know, it turned into all, uh, um, you know, like uh, just no trees and no whatever up there, didn't they bring that? cut zoo in and get it started up there from that actually come from cut zoo you know what i'm talking about yeah well it's a chinese plant originally and i don't know if they brought it to copper hill but they brought it to america and we'll get ken to answer that here in a minute and see if cut zoo worked out there for a while i don't think anything and, even and cut they, would uh, they actually planted that didn't they to keep the erosion down well, that's what the originally come to America for, and I don't know if they brought it to Copper Hill first or not. I don't think it was first, yeah. but it was used there. Yeah, yeah. and um, I don't know how we'll, – we'll find out how much success it was. All right. Thank you there, Sid. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Go ahead there. Uh, so, again, you've cut all the timber. Every tree. Every tree. And on top of this, the ore is a sulfide. We've talked a lot about copper this right. morning, but the ore is a sulfide. And the smelters and the technology of the 1800s did not allow them to direct smelt or do it all inside a furnace. So there was an intermediate step called a roast, which is basically making a pile of wood on the ground and placing the ore on it and letting it burn slowly. That's where a lot more of the timber went. And uh, when we do that, we get sulfur dioxide. And when we talk about acid rain, that's the source for acid rain in, in our world. Uh, today, it's coming mainly from where we're burning coal, here it was from roasting the ore. So the bottom line was you've cut all the timber and the adult growth off, and the acid rain coming off the roast piles is, is preventing any young plants from being able to reestablish. If you've ever saw a place clear cut, yes, it, it may look bad, but you also see an explosion of new growth. It may not be desirable growth, but you get a lot of regrowth occurring. This, this roast yard and this acid rain kept that from happening. So there was literally nothing on the soil to protect it. When it rained, all the soil began to wash away. Um, so Right into the Okoye River. Right into the Okoye River. And, and at that time, right on up to the Tennessee or the Hiawassee and then the Tennessee and, and down to the Gulf. Mm -hmm. um, so things, a, lot, a lot of that's somewhere else. Now, a right? lot of that's somewhere else. Uh, things began to, to change. Uh, you had a couple of things that happened. And by the 1870s, there weren't any timber left to cut. And the mines closed, not necessarily because of that, but because it was too expensive to keep bringing everything in and out by wagon. By this time, you've built what we call the Old Copper Road, or sometimes they call it the Okoe Road or the River Road, through the gorge to tie the operations in the basin to the railroad in Cleveland. In 1890, a rail line is built into the basin, and the mines reopen, and now you can bring coal in to run your furnaces and run your equipment and run your steam engines, but they're still having to open roast, so they're logging in Georgia and floating it down the Okoe, well, it's the Tacoa River in Georgia, mm -hmm. and Okoe in Tennessee, but floating it down the river to fuel the roast yards, because you're still having to roast it, so... Even though there's no timber left to be cut, you're still getting a lot of uh, environmental damage impact from those roast yards in the 1890s. But around 1904, they developed a way to smelt it without roasting it. And, and that allowed them to begin to capture the sulfur dioxide and make sulfuric acid, which they were doing by 1909. And actually making more profit. Making a product, yes. And We've got documents in the museum's collection from the 1860s where they're talking about how profitable making acid will be once they have the technology. So, you know, we love the word state-of-the-art, and we say, oh, this is state-of-the-art. Uh, it's the best we can do. Open roasting was state-of-the-art in the 1850s and 60s. Uh, those companies weren't just using that because they were short-sighted or or you know, didn't want to take the time. Now, now, granted, they weren't concerned with what the long-term impact was on the landscape, but uh, you don't have to force a company to make money. 
and and they knew if they could recover the sulfur they could make sulfuric acid and would make a lot more profit on the acid that didn't occur until the first decade of the 20th century uh, and they did start looking at revegetating it by the end of the 1920s and early 30s and uh didn't have a lot of success, though, did Not it? early on. Uh, the problem was the erosion, uh, mm -hmm. the amount of erosion. You had lost all the topsoil in most places. Uh, you were, plus there were chemicals in that, what was left, too, right? Well, not so. my understanding is not so much because, again, sulfur dioxide is water-soluble. Right. So it doesn't persist in the soil. It would have moved on when it rained on with the soil, mm -hmm. but you had eroded down to a layer of soil that was acidic. Uh, so it, it was not really great for supporting a lot of plant life. And the other problem was you, you were down to a level that really didn't have the nutrient in the organic matter. So it, it wasn't so much that it was, you know, poisoned from past operations is that you had eroded down to a layer that was sterile. Close to rock, maybe? Well, it, it, it's not the rock. You're just, you're just below the topsoil and in some places below the subsoil. Now, uh, Caller asked about kudzu. Did they bring in kudzu and did it work? Well, the matter of whether it worked or not, I guess, is open to debate. <laughs> yeah. It certainly survived, yeah. uh, but kudzu was imported, uh, and not just in the basin. And I'm pretty sure we weren't first, but right. it was brought into this country by the, uh, by the Department of Agriculture for erosion control and was planted all across the south. Um, and probably one of the reasons we're not allowed to bring exotic plants into this country today is kudzu is a good example of why. Um, but uh, TVA, uh, working with the company, uh, produced a plan in 41 for revegetating the basin. And uh, they were looking at bringing in different plants to do what they call gully plugs. They would plant these down in the bottom of the gullies behind little check dams to try to hold some of the soil in place. And and quite a bit of kudzu was planted in the basin through the 50s and 60s. Uh, probably by that time it was beginning to be abandoned. Uh, as they began to find out all across the south, it, it grows at a much more prolific rate in our climate and uh, doesn't have a lot of natural predators here. Uh, and the other big problem with kudzu that we're all aware of now is it will choke out uh, existing plants or timber. And uh, it's also the first thing to die when we get a frost, and it's the last thing to green up in the spring. So it's waiting on a spark or a lightning strike for a good part of the year. You get a good, nice ground fire. The problem is the kudzu comes back better than ever after mm -hmm. you burn it off, mm -hmm. and everything it had grown over dies when it got when it they, got they burned. They say it grows a foot a day. Uh, yes. So that's so don't sit next to it on a warm day. See, I think, uh, and uh, Doug Mizell, who uh, used to be here on the radio with us, he, he's got a country called Cutsonal, mm -hmm. where he actually made kutsu uh, gasoline. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, well, talk about a resource. <laughs> right. <laughs> talk about all you have to do is, you know, I said, if he'd go around the south and harvest that and make gas of it, I think we'd run cars forever, wouldn't we? If, <laughs> if it gives a good yield, we surely would. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, um, he says it's just like any other gasoline. It's anything that you can get to ferment uh you can make gasoline which makes sense but it seemed like it'd be a product that we didn't it'll grow up down sideways <laughs> but uh now but the big uh you know there's some uh what was it glenn holding is that the company glenn springs holding glenn springs holding got the contract or or was a company for tell me how that and they're the ones who really reforced is that true or, or? not so much okay tell me the tell me the whole story well there. let's let's go back okay so by the 1940s, they've got a, a plan. And, uh, you know, something happened in December of 41 that sort of put things on hold for a few years, World War II. Uh, but coming out of the war, uh, they began to do a lot of work replanting and reclaiming, uh, starting out on the edge because the further out you moved, the less severe the erosion and the chance of better finding soil. Yeah. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. I got, I got to turn you up. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to speak to the guy there that, that's talking about the copper basin up there. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to find out where I can get some information on uh, the Tennessee Shaft area, Cantrell Flats, Arn Roasters in that area there. Back in the 70s, I helped on the Tennessee Shaft. They had uh, 
miners out of Salt Lake City, I think, to come in there and sink the shaft. But we worked down on 175 in Chattanooga, electricians local. And uh, I was one of them that helped put the cables down in the shaft to pump all the water out while they were sinking it. And I'd like to find out some information on it, or I can get on uh, Canton Flats and Arn Roaster and all that stuff in there. Go yes, ahead. sir. Uh, I'm guessing you were involved with what they were terming Project Copper Hill at that time? At that, they just call it Tennessee Shack. Okay. Well, that, there was quite a few things going on at that time. Uh, you just need to give us a call at the museum. Our number is 423-496-5778. And uh, obviously, I'm not in the office today because I'm here on the radio. But if you could give us a call one day next week. Or if you if you do the email, you can send us an email uh, our email address is, uh, this is all one word, it's Burra Hill, B-U-R-R-A-H-I-L-L, at dot com. Uh, we have uh, some of the records from that, from that work, and uh, there was quite a bit. The company had an internal newsletter called The Topics uh, that we have at back issues. We have those issues on file and uh, we probably can find something on that project uh, in the topics at that time. It may not mention your name, but it will certainly yeah. include the work that you're talking about doing, and and we're more than happy to do that. Uh, we, we do yeah, that quite I, often. That was back in the 70s yes, when sir. I was there, and the people that worked there for the city service, and uh, I got a lot of information from the old fellers. Mm -hmm. I guess they're all gone now, but... Uh, Four two three four nine six seven seven eight. Four two three four nine six seven five. No, excuse me. Four nine six five seven seven eight. All right. Your name is Ken Rush. Ken Rush. If you want to give me a call Monday, that'd be great. We're open ten a.m. to four thirty. I appreciate it, sir. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Bye. We actually do that quite often, and, uh, you know, there were a lot of subcontractors that mm -hmm. were involved in that work. The The company was employing 2,500 people at that time, but they probably had another 1,000 to 1,200 subcontractors involved in that project. Um, but let's see, picking back up with the Reclam reclamation, yeah. uh, out on the perimeter they have had some good soil where it hadn't all eroded out, and, and they were primarily going in with Virginia and Loblolly Pines because – Pines will grow on mineralized soil, and we had eroded below the organic soil. The you know the top soil was gone, mm -hmm. uh, and they were doing the the kudzu, and they were doing what was called fleece flower, which is another exotic that locals call chicken shade or <laughs> or knotweed. Uh, it it grows prolifically, uh, and uh, you find it up and down the Okoe now, where it's washed out of mm -hmm. the basin, and you see it along the banks. Um, but again, not a lot of success through those decades in the in the core. the The original impact area was about thirty two thousand acres, and by the nineteen sixties, you still had about twenty thousand acres that was totally barren. In fact, that photograph is is in the middle of that section. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the seventies that the science began to catch up with the problem. You know, the problem was they didn't have any good soil. And, you know, if it's behind our house, we go buy a few truckloads of topsoil and bring right. it in. Well, we needed topsoil on 20,000 acres, so bringing soil in wasn't really an option. Go ahead. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Hey, Ron. Hey. The man's down there at the Peerless Road Farmer's Market with tomatoes, strawberries, petunia plants, uh, tomato plants, pepper plants, radishes, onions, lettuce, and carabies. You making me hungry? Okay, right. he's got some good stuff on there. How long is he gonna be there? He's gonna be there till about twelve, unless you won't go by there after you get off. Well, uh, if I don't make it, everybody else will be able to make it. I hope they sell out before I get there. Well, I hope so too, Ron. Thank you, man. All right, bye bye now. Bye bye. All right, go ahead, there. Sure. So, uh, by the nineteen seventies, the the company at that time, which was City Service, uh, they had taken over for Tennessee. They bought out Tennessee Copper. Uh, 
they asked the Forest Service to come in and help them develop some new techniques. Uh, at that time, they were still having a 90% mortality rate. Nine out of ten trees died wow. within a year of being planted. And uh, there's a lot to it, and I'm going to try to boil it down to some real quick answers. Uh, one of the things that was beginning to be understood was that the need that there's fungus in, in healthy soil. There's certain fungi that live in topsoil that plants need. Well, that horizon was gone, so the, the plants they were setting out didn't have the partner they, they use in nature. And by the 70s, the Forest Service teams were understanding this, so they started what they called inoculating. They would dip the seedling in the fungus and then plant it. Uh, they would also use a, a fertilizer tablet or pellet uh, you know, the broadcast, you know, the 10, 10, 10 we put on our garden, it's gone the first time it rains. Mm -hmm. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. How you doing, Rod? I'm doing fine, Brad. How are you? Good. What's going on? I, I was going to tell you uh, the Braves lost last night. Oh, no. The Braves didn't lose last night, did they? They did. What was the final score? 7-5. to five. Well, they had been doing really well there. They had been on a winning streak, so... We got we got snapped by the uh, the Nationals. Yep. Okay. And uh, do they yeah. play? Do, do they play today if it's not raining? Uh, we played today. Uh, we played tonight at seven ten. Are they, are they at Atlanta? Yeah. I don't know if they're going to play today or not. It's it's going to rain all day. And tomorrow and tomorrow too. And I think Monday and Tuesday. So besides that, it'll be dry. Hey, you know, you know, I was in the studio. I heard that somebody told me you were in the studio. I was in the studio uh, with uh, Mark and Lisa. Oh, well, the, it, the show got better then, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Brett, did you let Maggie and Brianna down easy? What? Did you let Maggie and Brianna down easy? You know, Maggie's my girlfriend still. Oh, she 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 put up with uh, you not going on that date? Do what? She put up with you not going on the date? Yeah. Well, so now, so it, was he making a date with another girl on the radio? Yeah. That's not smart now, Brett. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other girlfriend could be listening. Yeah, she has a boyfriend. Oh. Oh, she has a boyfriend, so you just paying her back then, right? Yeah. Oh, I understand now. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's Brett, our roving reporter. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so these fertilizer pellets would uh, break down slowly, usually last about three years, so it gave the plant sort of a boost to get started. Slow release. Thing. Slow release, yeah. time release, yeah. exactly. There's the word I was struggling for. Um, and also they began uh, aerial seeding some different grasses with helicopters. These grasses were all designed uh, to only live a short time. They were shade intolerant, so they didn't want them to compete with the trees long term so once the tree grew tall enough to block the light the grass would die but that puts you some organic matter back in the soil mm -hmm. so using these techniques they went from a 90 percent mortality rate to a 90 percent survival rate right and began the test plots were in the 70s they began using them in a wide scale in the in 1980 and what happened is not only were the trees they setting out surviving but they began to mature and produce second-generation growth on their own. So they'd been working to replant the basin for 40 years by that time and had very little success that you could see on the ground, but they had been learning those four decades. But by the 1990s, the bulk of the landscape now was revegetated because of those efforts that they put in in the, in the 80s or uh, using those techniques they developed in the 70s. Uh, now, jumping ahead to Glen Springs Holdings, th that revegetation work was done by the mining companies, uh, Tennessee Copper, City Service, and then Tennessee Chemical. Now, did they do that voluntarily, or was it, I, I'd heard that, you know, there, there are lawsuits, lawsuits, instead of paying attorneys, let's just go put the trees back. Well, it, was, it would be what we term today a good faith project. Okay. They were under pressure. But there was no mandate or legal order requiring them to do so. But D by don't. doing so, they probably avoided those from coming. Right. Uh, but the bulk of that land they were replanting was their land. Okay. And, and they wanted to see some return on that investment. But they were also under pressure to keep the sediment out of the river. Uh, right. that, you know. Um, now, Glen Springs Holdings, they've been in the basin for the last dozen years. Um, their story is a little different. 
When the last mining company, Tennessee Chemical, went into bankruptcy in 1989, the mines had closed in 87. Tennessee Chemical was still running the acid plant and some of the associated chemical lines uh, bringing sulfur in. They went into bankruptcy in 89, and they were, they were parties interested in buying the chemical plant in Copper Hill because it was still making product and, and making money, but no one wanted to buy the old abandoned mine properties or the old Isabella complex, which is no longer in use at this point, or the old London Mill complex. And so that stayed in receivership through the bankruptcy. And what the federal government and the state does is when the company of record goes away, they start looking for previous owners. And if you're still around, you're what they refer to as a potentially responsible party, which is a polite way of saying, uh, if we take you to court, you'll be found responsible, at least mm. a portion. Uh, Occidental Petroleum had bought City Service after City Service had sold the operations off. So Occidental never owned the mines in the basin, never owned the operations. But when you buy a company, you buy their legacy. And and I'm oversimplifying this, but, but basically Oxy was on the hook because they had bought City's Service. And... Glen Springs Holdings is a subsidiary of Occidental Petroleum that Oxy had formed to remediate some coal mining properties in the 1970s that they were responsible for, and they've kept them in existence to do this type of work. Uh, Oxy began negotiating with the state and EPA in the 90s, and they ultimately reached an agreement. This is, this is under what they call the Voluntary Oversight and Assessment Program, but Oxy agreed to remediate these abandoned mine properties and the old Isabella complex and the London Mill complex uh, under the guidance or under the authority of the state of Tennessee and EPA. Um, and so Glen Springs Holdings is sort of Oxy's player on the ground. And they began work in 2000, they signed their agreement in 2001 to begin remediating, cleaning up these properties. And most of the work Oxy and their subsidiary, Glen Springs Holdings, is doing is water quality driven uh, and, and what I like to call critter quality. Uh, it wasn't human hazard. It was in uh, it, the life in the river. So they're responsible for cleaning up the two creeks that drain the basin prior to them emptying into the Okoe River. Is it one of those Potato Creek? Potato Creek and Davis Mill Creek. Okay. And uh, the work they've been doing the last 12 years has been primarily on those watersheds and cleaning up around the, uh, the man and properties. It's much too much. We take up way too much of your time this morning on that. If anyone's really interested in these projects, they can contact us at the museum. Uh, the museum is the, co is the community point contact for this work, and we have a lot of documents, and uh, I can get them in touch with the public repository if they really want to get in depth and read about this. W was there any critters in the water back Early last... on, at that time, very little. Uh, they were so heavily impacted, you had, you had two or three problems. One, uh, a lot of the creeks through the industrial areas had been channelized, and, and you know, a straight ditch is very efficient in moving water, not efficient in supporting life. Uh, you also had a lot of metals that were leaching into the creeks. Part of it was due to the erosion, uh, just exposed soil. Part of it was due to industrial operations. You had different products and byproducts that had been put on the surface, whether they're concentrates from the milling or ore that was never processed. So they have to dig these off the surface, and they're actually putting them back in one of the collapsed mines to get them off the watershed. Big project. Big project. Yep, lost that person. Um, They'll call back. The, I'm sure they will. Uh, so the, there was no fish there. There's nothing. Right. Now, this water from Potato Creek and Davis Mill Creek runs over to Tacoa or Okoye. Okoye. Okoye on this side. Yeah, you, mm -hmm. you, which side is which. So all that is now was in Okoye for many, right. many years. Yep. And I remember Parksville Lake was pretty, pretty water. Right. Didn't have much stuff in it, though, no. did it? I mean, so, no. so the Copper Hill actually affected water quality yes. all the way to the to the uh to the gulf well certainly through parksville now you know one of the things that happens as it empties further downstream is you get more volume of water and you know this sounds like a, a smart answer but you know dilution 
Yeah. Sometimes it's the solution. You know, you can change your numbers by adding more water. I'm not saying that made it cleaner. And the heavier metals are going to settle. Well, as some th- too. they can settle, yes. And but but a lot of it just has to do with dilution. You know, you change the part per million if mm-hmm. you add more water. Uh, but the problem in Parksville was the the copper in particular uh, keeps a lot of algae from growing. So that's why the water was so clear. But it's also without those algaes, you don't get a lot of the uh, the food chain to establish. It's 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 back to it is, pretty normal. It is now. getting there. It yeah. still has a way to go, but it is much improved in the last two decades. A big part of the improvement came with the revegetation work because once you lock the sediment up, it stopped washing into the Okoe. And you know you think, well, that sediment it's just dirt. Well, no, it's carrying metals because they're found in the soil. Uh, and then Glen Springs Holdings began treating the flows of those two creeks before they emptied into the river when they came on site in 2002. Good morning, you're live on Old Town Cleveland. Good morning. I'm really in learning a lot from this program. I just wanted to testify that the Coy River and Lake Okoy has come a long ways towards improving the quality for uh, fisheries. And uh, the reason I know this is I'll... I've been uh, monitoring a bald eagle nest right at the mouth of the Coy River near Greasy Creek and Silco. And bald eagles is kind of on the top of the food chain. They eat the fish, fish and frogs and snakes and lizards out of the river, and uh, they've they've been there now about five years. So I think that's a fantastic indication. Plus, I know a lot of fishermen they have fish fishing tournaments now in Lake Okoy, so mm-hmm. those are all good signs. I think that whatever holding company is doing it, they're doing the right thing, and I applaud them, and I hope they'll continue to improve that. I, I think just time is now, you know, they've done a lot of, you know, the, the vegetation, of course, now the pine beetles have come through and got a bunch of them, which hurt, didn't it? Well, you know, it's again, that's a disaster in your backyard, but that's the next step in succession. But also, in a those forest. rotten trees fall. That's which, right. You're you putting know. organic right, matter right. back, and you're letting what's happening in those dead pine stands uh-huh. now, or a lot of hardwoods are coming in, maples in particular. That's good. So the forest will eventually succession back to hardwood, and that was their goal from the beginning in the 30s, was to get it back to what they call a successional forest. It starts as pine, it'll transition to hardwood. And we won't see the day, but there'll be a point in the future, maybe 100 years from now, where the untrained eye will have a hard time telling it from the surrounding forest. It'll only be when you start looking at the age of the trees that you realize, well, mm-hmm. you know, these oaks are not as old as those oaks. Or whenever you start trying to walk through the forest and find all these gullies. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you wonder why it's so up and down. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, Doug? Well, I just want to say I've witnessed bald eagles flying over the rafters' head. Oh yeah, I've I've seen I've seen him uh, I've seen one of them once sitting out on, right there in the water one time on a log or something. Right. Uh, All right. And I was just thinking about Arnold's grandfather. I bet he had some big arms swinging that sledgehammer. Uh, my grandfather was a relatively big man for his time. He's been described to me around six one, six two, and about. 230 pounds. That's a big guy to be in the mine, too, isn't Mm -hmm. it? He hit his head a bunch. I'd say he did. (laughs) He would have made a good tackle for the Bradley Bears. Uh, He most definitely would at that particular time. (laughs) Well, I'm really enjoying this program, and I'm going to hang up so you can continue on. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Talking about the improvement in Parksville Lake when I was a teenager learning to drive, the river road was my training ground for driver's license Mm -hmm. every weekend up and down the river road. Mm-hmm. But at that time, if you went to Parksville Lake, you didn't go up there to go fishing. Mm-hmm. Today, you do. It, so it, that's, it was a swimming hole, yeah. 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 Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. This is T-Bandy. Hey, T-Bandy. I don't need to tell everybody about the fish truck I'm having uh, June the 1st. June the 1st. You're going to have a yeah, fish right. truck? Do you have to pre-order or can you pick them up that day? You can pick them up that day or just call my number, 478-2405. But they're going to be running from 11 to 12 this time. 11 to 12. So if you need fish yeah. for your lakes or ponds, here's the man to see right here. That, Give uh, them that number again there. 478-2405. All right. I was listening to the uh, fellas from up there at Copper Hill. I, in the 60s, I... I, I 
took 10 ton of fertilizer up there in bags, triple 19, I think it was, up there from the use. Well, that's, uh, well, they put that on the ground and it come down to the Okoy River. <laughs> Probably. I don't know. But they were getting little trees started back then when I took that mm-hmm. yeah, it, it, pitch pan bags. Uh, I know Deb talked about having family live up there and they swept their yard. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. So. yeah, no, I remember driving up there and driving back over that mountain in front of two transfer trucks. That sounds like fun. I wouldn't want to do that today. No. I met one, and, and there was one behind me. <laughs> and then I had to go to the bathroom when I got back down. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, did you have to go, or did you have to clean yourself after you I got back? clean myself. <laughs> okay. There's a difference. That really, my knees was knocking when I got to the co-op. <laughs> but uh, I just remembered them days. Uh, thank I you, T. I remember them days. All right, yeah, it's not trouble me to remember anything. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. I can say I've had a few experiences on that river road, oh, very have, similar. As have I. Have we, it's a little better now that the um, they got that big, they trimmed off that one that stuck out. Monday so Bluff. Monday, yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you do to get to work when the, the rock side, did you go to Coker Creek every day? That was extra, it was not pleasant. That was a yeah. two-hour trip every morning? It was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Luckily, my, my board allowed me to go to four days a week. Yeah. So that saved me one day. Well, but yeah. uh, I've, I've told people, and it's the truth, I used to enjoy that drive up that way. But when I had to do it every day for yeah, months. That's every once in a while, yeah. Uh, well, couldn't you go up there? What is it? Uh, go up through Greasy Creek and the McKenzie Highway? Oh, I, I tried all those little side routes. Now, and they, they, and they, that they, scared the... It's pretty, I was we, like the gentleman that just called. It, it's I did tough. them once. It's pretty tough, isn't it? And, and actually, so many people were trying to use Kimsey Highway that the Forest Service ended up closing it because it's not meant for that volume of traffic. I haven't never went up there. Everybody says, I go, well, I, I don't want to take my car up through there, I don't think. Or How bad is it? Well, it's not – the road is not the problem – for me, growing up in West Tennessee, it's bed up there on the side of those mountains and looking off and thinking, if yeah. I fall off here, the only way they'll know I'm here is there, when the buzzards there, circle. There, there is a couple of places up there that if you go off the side of the road, you're going down a long ways before you find the first tree. Yes. it's. I've Does, been through there a few times myself. Do they myself. have guardrails? No guardrails. No guardrails. Nothing. Okay. I'll just uh, I'll just. Like I said, I I tried, you know, a lot of locals were giving me these alternate routes, and I did them all once, and then I decided, no, it's not worth it. Well, I'm going to ask you uh, (laughs) a a semi-political question now. All right. Uh, For 40, 50 years now, we've talked about building Corridor J, which is part of the Appalachian Mm -hmm. Development Project, which makes APD 40, Mm -hmm. Corridor J. That road going across there, and we've mm-hmm. talked about it through six, seven governors now. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your opinion about that? I, I keep saying one day the mountain's going to give loose, and uh, you won't get to Copper Hill for a long time. The road is definitely needed. Yeah. And uh, I'll be honest, anyone that didn't think it was needed, uh, I would have liked for them to have driven that other route twice. Mm-hmm. Once at night and once on a day it was raining. Um, it is needed. Uh, I understand it's very expensive, oh, and I understand, and I understand the, uh, the the routing is sensitive because it is through the National Forest, um, but the road is needed, and, uh, you know, the reality is, you know, we can't turn back the hands of time. There are communities there that are dependent on being linked to the other services in this state. Uh, you know, there's quite a few uh, individuals living in the basin that uh, you know, there's no VA in the basin. If you're if you're getting services from VA, you have to get to Chattanooga or point or Cleveland or points beyond. Uh, there's a lot of the other medical services driver's that license. are not the driver's license. Uh, uh, a lot of county and state services you have to come west to get those. You can't run to Georgia and get your Tennessee driver's license. No, and you and they don't take ten care in Georgia either. So there's a vast section of the population there that it's critical for them to be able to connect. Uh, 
how the road gets paid for, I don't know. I have said, well, you know, I doubt I ever drive on it, but I, it's not to say I don't. We don't need uh, it. And from an economic standpoint, not only do we need it to, for those people there, but the the ability to bring people out of North Carolina into here right. that would bypass going to Atlanta or to Knoxville would be an economic boom for Copper Hill. Well, let me tell you, you may not be aware of this. Uh, approval's been given. The Cherokee are building a casino in Murphy. Yeah. So the amount of traffic that is going to be on that road in the next few years is probably going to double uh, because their market is the Chattanooga region. Uh, you know, that's yeah. one of the reasons they're putting it there. I understand if we said go on the road today, we're 10 years away before a car would drive on it. I would think that would be I would, conservative. I would. I would be surprised to see it in 10 years. Uh, the yeah. road projects alone, you know, always to me it says if somebody would be working on it, I think it would happen faster. You ever go past these road developments and there's no one working? I go, you know, if there's someone here working every day, they'd go a little faster. But am I missing something there? <laughs> <laughs> so well, it, I, I think one thing about road projects is they're, they're so expansive. Mm -hmm. And you have to work on a stage and then move to the next stage and do the same work again and again and again. So I think a lot of times a lot of people look at that and see a lot of construction areas that's not being worked on, but it's because they're moved somewhere else trying to do the same thing to get ready, you know, get the whole thing ready for the next step. Mm -hmm. So, hey, you know, I, I've been involved in the construction industry for in one form or, or another most of my life, and a lot of times things are going on when it's not really – Right. noticeable but it looks like they're standing around doing nothing or nobody's doing anything there always got to be someone yeah. with a, a blueprint going pointing <laughs> yeah i'll tell you something else that the road would really benefit us is if you get the primary east west traffic off the gorge look how much more recreation opportunities yes. Yes. be available yes. in Definitely. the gorge a lot safer at least mm -hmm. good morning live on old town cleveland good morning ron hey i'd like to ask your guest was How'd they uh, discover copper in that region there? Was there ore on the surface? And is there any history of uh, Native Americans, uh, I don't know if you call that mining, mm -hmm. harvesting uh, copper there? Yeah, well, yeah well, he's, uh, he's got a pretty good story on that. Okay, go ahead there, those are Those are great questions. Uh, the copper was originally discovered by a gentleman named Lemons. Uh, he was in the mountains after the Cherokee removal prospecting for gold. Uh, you know, most of us are aware of Dahlonega and the gold strikes in, in North Georgia, and prospectors were all through these mountains after Dahlonega looking for the next strike, and Mr. Lemons was as well. And what he found was a section of a deposit that a creek had actually cut into. And it exposed some of the ore through erosion where the creek had cut into the deposit. And uh, a lot of the ore in the basin contains a lot of pyrite, uh, fool's gold. And the, the story is now, we, we can't document this, and you know humans love good stories, so there may be a little embellishing here, was that Lemons made his discovery at the end of the day, and it was getting dark, and he went to bed thinking he had found gold. Yeah. And then the next morning, when he could look at it a little closer, realized he had found what he was referring to as an oxide of iron and an oxide of copper. It's where it had oxidized from being uh, exposed to the uh, water in the air. Uh, and so he moved on down the road, but other people heard about what he had found and sent another gentleman in named Weaver, who did some more digging and sent several samples up to be assayed up at the Revere Smelting Works outside of Boston. And a few of those came back high in copper, and as we say, the, the boom is on. Uh, after the word got out, the speculators and the land buyers jumped in with both feet. So uh, it was not on the surface by itself, but the creek had cut into it and it had and shown it to where lemons where he could see it along the creek bank. Yeah, and we talked about this before the show is <clears throat> there was no roads up there at this time. No. This was virgin forest. The Indians had had a village in there, or a couple mm -hmm. villages mm -hmm. in there, uh, and uh, did that? Do you, did any report of them using any of that copper? There are. There's a couple of accounts. Uh, the one in particular uh, in the 1880s. A uh, it's 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 listed in a report, uh, pretty well documented. 
a gentleman was out after a heavy rain. And, and again, by the 1880s, the timber's gone. So mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to see things mm -hmm. because everything's been exposed. And uh, he found what appeared to him to be a pre-white hearth. It was some crude stone that had been cut and arranged in a furnace. And he found clay pottery that had copper remnants on the lips and around the edges. And uh, he, he uh, contacted the Smithsonian. Uh, and actually it was in existence at this time, and they had teams in the South collecting artifacts, and the story goes that, that all of this was came and, and crated up. And, you know, if you've ever saw the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark where there's that warehouse and all those boxes, those actually exist in Washington. There are mm -hmm. boxes upon boxes of artifacts that probably haven't been looked at since they were originally collected. We need those for the museum, do we We not? do need those for the museum. Uh, but with that said... Uh, in the last several decades, the technology has gotten where they can do the, uh, I have trouble with this word, spectrography, where they can mm -hmm. look at an item and look at its atomic signature and then determine where it came from. Because, you know, copper is not copper. They all have a unique atomic signature depending on what region they have came from. And some items have shown up in university collections in the last several years that are of the Ducktown deposits. And... Uh, the biggest question now when I've talked to anthropologists, it's not whether the uh, Native Americans work the copper in the basin. It's whether they developed the ability to do that independently or they learned it from the Spanish. Uh, because the Spanish explorers, DeSoto and others, were coming through these regions and they would hire uh, different Indians from different tribes and regions to be their guides. And, of course, you only got them through your section. When they get to the next guy, you go back home. But you've learned all these techniques from the Spanish. So the big debate now amongst archaeologists and anthropologists are whether the Cherokee and their ancestors would have learned this independently or whether they would have developed it for, or picked it up from the Spanish. And, you know, I, I sort of skipped over this when we were talking about the ore. There's an upper portion of the ore in the basin that would have been weathered over geologic time where the copper would have washed down and then been redeposited, and it would have been a very narrow zone, only a few inches to a few feet in thickness, but that would have been possible to have been smelted without that roasting taking place. The, the roasting I was referring to was required on what they call the primary ore, which lay at depth, but the tops of these deposits would have had what was a small area of what was referred to as black copper that where the ore was two percent copper some of these black copper zones were 40 and 50 percent copper and and it would have been able to have been smelted very easily in a small hearth Did that answer your question yes sir it brings up a hundred more <laughs> <laughs> i know yes it does hey, I, I, uh... Uh, this, this is a this is very interesting i gotta check that museum out please come see us come see us tell us when it's open uh, thank we're, you we're open monday through saturday uh, 10 a.m. to 4:30 through the through the summer months. Uh, we'll we'll shift to winter hours in November, and our website is DucktownBasinMuseum.com. All one word: DucktownBasinMuseum. Good looking, uh, good looking website too. Hey, we need to take a break here and pay a little bills. We'll be back in just a few minutes. We've got Ken Rush talking about Ducktown, Copper Hill, Turtle Town. Let's get this call before we go. Go ahead. Hey, you got a, a man down there? They call Sea Wolf. Or used to. Well, I, I used to go by that back in uh, the bad old days of CB language. Yeah, well, this is a mountain climber. Well, how you doing, old man? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. I called in to ask a question. Go for it. I've always heard that they got enough gold out of their mines to pay all their employees. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a pretty prevalent uh, story. Uh, I, I hate to disappoint, but, uh, you know, the, the, the records just don't back that up. And, and I'll be honest, I've had a lot of people tell me, well, you didn't grow up here and you don't know. And, uh, but you know, I've got a pretty good argument to, to make, so I'm going to just make it real quick. The, the payroll was, a, was $1.75 million in the thirties Wow. and gold was $35 an ounce in the thirties. And if they were getting enough gold out to meet their payroll at that time, when we took the price controls off of gold in the 70s and it jumped up to a couple of hundred dollars an ounce, 
they would have been making money hand over fist and they wouldn't have cared what copper was bringing or what sulfur was bringing either they would have kept mining for the gold now the there was a little bit of gold in the ore and the companies did recover it and i think that's where the story starts but unless they had a lot of people in on the fix including uncle sam and you know he likes to get paid he doesn't look kindly at you cutting him out of the loop uh, they were only recovering about 40 or 50 troy ounces of gold a year, and they were processing about 2 million tons of ore. Uh, there's a National Geographic article in the 30s on the, on the operations, and they talk about there being a dime's worth of gold in every ton of refined copper. But well, but that story's still there, and I, there's several people up there that tell me I'm just I dead guess. wrong that the company never reported it and they hid it. It's sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars an ounce now. That's a right. couple of ounces would be worth a lot of money. It surely would. <laughs> hey, well, thank. I've heard that all my life. I have as well. Well, we got some more tales we're gonna tell here in a few minutes. All right. <laughs> thank you. All right, we'll be back in just a few minutes, folks. W O O P L P Cleveland, Tennessee. Check into, check into cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the match. Check into cash gives you more money for your title and the lowest title loan rate anywhere. We'll beat any rate on a title loan and we guarantee it. So you'll save money. If you already have a title loan, ask check into cash about paying it off. So if you're short on cash, think check into cash. No credit check, no run around. Check into cash won't slow you down. Check into cash, your one-stop money shop for 20 years. Now offering payday loans without a check. Great service, convenience, and locations. Check into, check into cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the max. Oh, yeah. Check into cash is your money machine. Bring proof of lower rate on similar title loan. Use payday advances responsibly. Visit checkintocash.com for the store nearest you. Wheeler Technologies has moved. Visit them at their new location at 490 Grove Avenue Southwest next to Bradley Rentals. Same great folks, same great service with a better location to serve you. Call Wheeler Technologies for voice, data, and security needs at 664-TECH. That's 664-8324. And remember, depend on Wheeler Technologies for the current time and temperature every day at 476-1111. Tennessee Alarm Contractor C-175. Did you know that local businesses produce more income, jobs, and taxes that stay in your local community than national chain stores do? For every $100 spent in a locally owned business, $45 stays in the local economy, while only $15 stay locally when you buy at a national chain store. When you buy from Mermaid Mattress, you are shopping local. Plus, when you buy direct from the factory, you get a better mattress at a better price, guaranteed but only at Mermaid Mattress here in Cleveland. One half mile off 25th Street on Georgetown Road, right here in beautiful Cleveland, Tennessee. Call 472-2486. Locally in Cleveland at Mermaid Mattress. Find out why Fro Daddy and Matador both sleep on a locally made mattress at Mermaid. You give them a call at 472-2486. Mermaid Mattress. Join us weekdays at 9 o'clock right here on 99.9 Whoop FM. It's the All Music Music Hour. Settle into your office, at home, or wherever you listen and enjoy a full hour of all of your classic country and bluegrass favorites right here on 99.9 Whoop FM. You are listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music.
Welcome back to Old Town Cleveland here on Whoop FM 99.9, or you can go to the internet at www.whoopfm.com. You can call us here like this caller at 614-5553. Good morning, caller. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Good morning, Ron. Hey, Red. I have a question. Yeah. All them uh, mines up there where all them shafts was, why don't that place cave in? Well, uh, you know, it's... It's, there's mines in part of the area, but it's not everywhere. First off, the mines aren't under the town. So Copper Hill and Ducktown and McKaysville and Isabel are not over the mines themselves. There are areas that have caved to the surface. We talked about that a little bit earlier today. And there are areas that they anticipate will cave to the surface in the future. And they've gone ahead and built fences around them. But they're not under the towns and they're not under anyone's home. So the because the company owned most of the property up there, they could control where things were built. Uh, but there are some areas that they've actually got uh, monitors in the, in the ground that they look for ground movement, and they anticipate will cave at some point in the future. And TVA moved a power line several years ago because the feelings were it would be close to an area that had the potential to cave, so they went ahead and moved it over in advance. And as he said earlier, it's just it's really just hard rock. Right. I mean, you're it just the whole mountain's a rock, right? Right. Yeah, but them timbers give away where they had them mine shafts. Looks like it. Well, the you know they didn't have to do a lot of timbering in these mines because they're there it is hard rock, but. You know, around the shafts in the early days, they were timbered. But when you get into the 20th century, they concreted those shafts. But, but again, concrete doesn't last forever. So when you say something's never going to fall in, you know, that's a pretty bold statement. So, again, there's areas they anticipate will cave at some point in the future. Uh, the good news is it's not going to be under the roads or anybody's house when that happens. So they know exactly where the shaft is. Yes, th- those were all mapped out very precisely, and we actually have those maps as part of the museum's collection. Well, my grandpa used to work in them mines, and he said someday they'd cave in. Well, that's, that's a true statement because there are areas that have caved, and there's other areas that will be caving at some point in the future. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. I'm staying out of Copper Hill. <laughs> well, we wish you'd come visit us. Just, Trust me, it's safe in the towns. Just stay out of the mine. But getting to the town, you got to go past where they went down in there. There's got to be some under that road somewhere. Well, there's there's tunnels that run under the roads, but they're a thousand foot down. And and I'm just going to throw this out for you to think about. When you see a tunnel through a mountain, do you worry about the mountain falling in? Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay, well, then you might have a point. <laughs> Sure as I drove through there, it came in. Well, no, Red's got this point. If I don't go in there, I don't ever have to worry well, about that. Well, that's a true statement. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks. See you, Red. A uh, question came up right here on the Internet. If they think an area is going to cave in, can they do a controlled explosion and level it? Well, well I don't. I mean, you could take it down with a controlling explosion, but it wouldn't level it. It's going to yeah. create a hole in uh, the ground. That's what I, that was my thinking, yeah. too, kind of yeah. like the hole there at Burr Burr. Right. What Burr. they've done is they've built fences around these areas. They have built over 14 miles of fence. And, uh, you know, it sounds like everything up there is hollow. The reality is we could draw a box two by three miles and get every mine inside of that six-square-mile area. But that's not to say all of that six square miles is at risk of collapsing. The, the actual footprint of the areas they're concerned about is quite small, uh, a few hundred acres. And they've got these inside of fences. And because they can look at the maps, they can uh, anticipate and plan if everything that could fall did fall, where would the outer, outer edge be? And then they build their fence beyond that. But I'm sure they're, mu- they're much more content to just let it happen on its time than to try to force yeah. it to happen yeah. because the areas are fenced and no one goes inside the fence, so it's it's well, not an issue. You hope. Well, you know, we yeah. always encourage you to leave your name so we know what to put on well, the rock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how big is the hole there, Burr Burr? Oh, it's you know probably a couple of hundred foot across, and and that collapses three hundred fifty foot vertical. Okay. It goes down to a depth of three hundred fifty foot. So I mean, it doesn't look that deep when you're. I mean, well, can, when you're standing up looking down at it, right. Yeah. I mean, can I walk down in that hole? No, you cannot because that's inside one of the fence Well, areas. I mean, if if I had got permission, could I walk through there? I mean, is there a floor to it? No. There's no floor well, to it. 350 foot down. So if I walk in there, I'd 
drop 350 mm-hmm. feet. I don't want to do that. Right. Okay. That's and, a pretty, and, pretty good reason right there. And if anybody wants to try it, they better bring their own rocks. But you can't hit that water. No. It's it's <laughs> oh, it's up, further up, out than it looks. Yes, yeah. I, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think it, we've already used up all the rocks that's available to that, hit that water. There's no telling how many have been thrown off our parking lot. Uh, well. We have to bring gravel in. <laughs> I, I, I found one. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm right there I with you. I have to. I have to. And I didn't get close. No. Uh, but the, uh, the, the furthest I ever got, that little mud flat, just right. short of that. I've right. got a few rocks into okay. that. Okay. But that's about it. My shoulders are gone now. I can't throw it anywhere. <laughs> the, uh, uh, does, do they have a lot of trespassers? Um, not so much of late. Now, uh, back in the 90s, after the bankruptcy occurred um, and, and the company sort of wasn't watching the store any longer, uh, you had quite a bit of trespassing going on. And, and a lot of these areas, when they were active, really just had a strand of barbed wire around them, or, or if that. Uh, once Glen Springs Holdings came in to work, part of what they're tasked with, and we were talking about clean up water before, but they're also tasked with securing any physical hazard and they're the ones that have built the fence and you know this is six foot chain link with a with barbed wire across the top and uh, they keep these fences maintained because they have to make sure they're up and they patrol and they have guards that patrol these areas and if they catch you inside the fence they will prosecute and uh, you know it only takes one or two people getting prosecuted for word to get out and that stops the curious and, and the reality is the areas that are fenced, there's really nothing of value to steal inside of those areas. Just, but they're adventure and danger. Right. Yeah. And the danger is the part that keeps me out. It keeps me out as well. And going to jail is another I res- good one. I respect fences. Yeah, and jail. Yes. Uh, good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. I heard there was a cranberry bog established up there is that true it is true and that's that's another good question this morning uh there's actually uh over the last several years they have found cranberries in several locations in the basin and it is now thought to be the southernmost existing cranberry bogs in the in the country uh the one that sort of kicked everything off was on the old school property near the elementary school which is no longer in use. They've built a new elementary school right. up next to Copper Basin High School. But the old Kimsey Junior College mm-hmm. oh, yeah. property, uh, there was a cranberry bog there. And while that school was in use, the uh, school formed a nature conservancy and built a hiking trail down to the bog uh, and kept it cleaned out because they need sunlight. If you let it get overgrown yeah. with vegetation, the cranberries don't produce fruit. Uh, so there's that area. And then they found another area downstream on Chansey Town Creek that uh, TWRA has ended up acquiring, and they now maintain it as a as a uh, nature area, and there's cranberries in that area as well, and they have found them in other places along Chansey Town Creek as well. So uh, not, quite a few I cranberries. You know, this is not you know like we see on the commercials yeah. for the for the uh, ocean spray or or whatever. But uh, I've had cranberries off of these bogs, and they're very tasty. But it just produces a handful of fruit. Yeah. I wanted to uh, talk about one more myth I want to talk about. We talked sure. a little bit, and then we want to talk about maybe a myth, you know. And then I want to talk about the people sure. growing up there and the miners. And, mm-hmm. and some people say it might have been a rough town at one time. A little bit. Yeah, a mining town, but well, let's get this call. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Yeah. So, Samson, so with a wagon wheel? Yes. Hey, we're having that spaghetti dinner for veterans tonight. Okay. And tell us the location. Uh, it's at uh, 1114 North Congress Parkway in Athens, Tennessee. Yes, sir. That right across from the Hyatt. Hey, also, when you get a chance, I'd like to talk to someone about running an ad on your radio. Okay. Uh, what you need to do is call during the week or call Monday morning. Okay. Call this number and speak to Lisa. Okay, I can't. This number is so hard to get through to. Is, is that yeah. another number? Well, uh, no. This is our this is our main and only number, unfortunately. But now on usually on uh, Mondays and Tuesdays mornings, if you'll wait till about seven thirty, you can get in. That first thirty minutes is all our regulars who call in, who's got to call in to say hello to us. Then after that, between seven thirty and eight, you can usually get in. Seven thirty. Yes, sir. Okay. And her name is Lisa, and she's the station manager, and she would handle all the advertising. 
Yeah, because I, I listen to your... What channel is yours? Uh, we're, we're Old Town Clay. We're on uh, Saturday mornings. Okay, what... what uh, it's 99.9. 99.9. 9. 9. 9. 9. 9. 9. 9. Right. Yeah, that's the one we listen to. Well, thank you so much, everything again. Yeah. Now, like I say, just give us a call uh, there, and she can take care of that stuff. I'm just hey. here I'm just here on Saturday mornings, and that's all I know. Do you do any more advertising today? Today, well, we, we always make announcements. Okay, can you well, announce that yeah. about it starts at 5 tonight, music starts at 6? You just did. <laughs> oh, I just did? You're live on the air. Oh, okay, okay. A good Sounds good. All right, so uh, t- tell us this, uh, tell us the name and how much to get in again. It's uh, the Wagon Wheel at 1114 North Congress Parkway, right across from the higher Planet Makes the Tankers. Dinner starts at 5. It's twelve ninety nine to get in and listen to the band and eat. If you don't want to listen to the band, it's uh, $9. If you want to just listen to the band, it's $5. So come out and join us. The money's going to help veterans out, and we appreciate all your help. Well, thank you for calling us and letting us know. Yeah, we're live every Saturday night at 7. We have country music and live bands. All right, sounds good. Thank you okay. so much. Um, all right, bye-bye. Hey, don't forget the uh, post office is having uh, their food drive next Saturday. You hang some canned foods on the front of your mailbox if you can, or you can go by the post office and you can drop food off, and this uh, goes out to needy families around here. And I, I like I say, we always do this at Thanksgiving and Christmas, but people are hungry year-round, so this is a good time for us to uh, add back to some of these places that give out food to the needy families. So don't forget that. And real quick, next week here on uh, uh, – Old Town Cleveland. I've got where I was. <laughs> uh, you, know. you don't have that many shows now, Ron. That, that, you well, can see, keep track of you, it. See, Deb takes care of this. You're supposed to be doing this for me, Arnold. <laughs> uh, next week on Old Town Cleveland. Let me write that down here. Uh, we've got the people from Lake Winter Pasoka. Oh, that'd be a good so show. So another yeah. great show. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, these shows like we have them today and, and next week, and people just love these things. And mm-hmm. sometimes... It, shows are different. Some shows people want to listen to everything you got to say, and some shows people want to call mm-hmm. all the time. So you know this is sort of a mixed bag on here. People learn so much from if your conversation. Today. So here's here's the myth question. I asked you this earlier. Uh, I read it on uh, Facebook. You know, one of my pictures I posted. They said, uh, uh, "Well, the Kennedy family owned all that up there, and that's what the problem was." Or, or they're the ones that. Uh, tell us what you know about that being true or not true well uh tennessee copper company which was the primary company in the basin in the 20th century was on the majority ownership was the lewison family now they were out of new york and uh i've never heard that kennedy story it's it's entirely possible they could have been a minority shareholder because the tennessee corporation which owned the company which owned the copper hill plant was a new york based uh company that had offices in new york they were chartered in delaware which a lot of companies are in delaware because they have very good tax uh, laws in delaware uh, but the lewisons were an old family in new york and did i know ran with the uh, rockefellers and the guggenheim so i guess it's possible old joe kennedy might have might have known them as well they certainly would have been in the same social circles uh but i do think and i could be wrong that when city service acquired Tennessee Copper Company in 1963 that I do believe the Kennedy family was a shareholder in city service. I know the Gores were shareholders in city service, but I don't think either one were majority shareholders. So, uh, some remote. Thing. Right. So, so so something to that myth. But Could not, have been. Right. Okay. Most, most myths have a the, basis in fact. The, the, the story I heard was that the Kennedys were stockholders in city service companies, right. what I'd always heard. Right. And I think that's probably truer. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, if you have mutual funds today, you're the stockholders of a lot of different things you don't know about. That is very true. So, you know, a lot of I wish I had a mutual fund. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I wish so some of them were mutual. <laughs> so the, uh, the next thing I do, uh, Julius Roth mm-hmm. uh, come into the base in 58. 1858 uh, uh, i believe 54 54 okay and uh he combined some of the mines together right. and uh, right. uh he uh was of course then uh was very uh, become one of the richest men in in tennessee right uh if you don't know where his house is here in cleveland if you're going on Inman street out like you're going to go to 
uh, Copper Hill. After you go under the underpass, look to the right, and there's this big Gothic-looking house there. Thomas mm-hmm. Calloway actually built that house. Mm-hmm. Uh, he built a lot of houses around here, and then the uh, Julius Roth moved into that. Uh, they're always rumored that there's a tunnel underneath there, so mm-hmm. he could get his mind. But he moved down here so he could watch his copper go back and forth mm-hmm. uh, into the trains. He also uh, had a little store down at the bottom of the uh, mm-hmm. hill down there. If you look straight across from the top of the hill towards Fo- Fort Hill Cemetery, there's a big uh, metal g- gate around there, and the Julius, uh, I mean, the Roth family's buried right mm-hmm. here in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, he uh, was known to. He bought a mill, I believe, down around Parksville, mm-hmm. and he would take back from Cleveland around this road. It's a two-day trip. He'd take wheat towards his mill and ground it, and he also took liquor, I understand. Mm-hmm. And so he was making money going both ways. Yes, he was. Uh, so now that takes me uh, – so that's – you know, the Roth House is still here in Cleveland, and is there a tunnel underneath the railroad down there or not? People says there's something there, but no one's went underneath there. And that's, that's one of those myth truths – that I'm not going to go through there to find out if there's a tunnel underneath there because it may cave in, Red. Because <laughs> 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 it's not under hard rock. Go, uh, True. In, uh, now, but so taking whiskey back into the mountains up there, uh, th- this this was a rough life in the 1800s, was it not? I mean, this there there wasn't cable television no. or power no. or anything else. So, and th- did they all live in, in company houses? Um. Not everyone, um, and and to be honest, we don't have as complete of records for Rott's era mm-hmm. as we do the 20th century. But, uh, you know, mining by its very nature, you know, a lot of mining comes in the form of a boom town. It, it almost pops up overnight, and, uh, you know, the tendency to work hard, play hard is, uh, I think that's human nature, uh, not just peculiar to mining. You see this in a lot of... Uh, We'll say, we'll say boom towns, whether it's a logging community or a mill community. Mm-hmm. Uh, but certainly, yes, it was known as one of the roughest places in the country uh, and uh, probably earned that reputation and deserved that reputation. Um, and there are accounts of, uh, of, you know, everything had to be transported in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there wasn't farmland. We've already talked about what happened to the landscape. So, you know, food had to be brought back. So those wagons on the return trip, they were hauling copper to Cleveland down, but on the return trip up, they were hauling back supplies and foodstuffs for the companies and for the workers that were living there. And certainly, I'm sure some alcohol got transported back and forth. Uh, you know, the, that place is no different than any other. Yeah, uh, that, there are accounts at the turn of the century of, of the old Isabella Company in the 1890s after the railroad came in for them getting kegs of beer delivered uh, via the railroad. And we've actually got a photograph of that when it occurred one day and all the guys are out there getting ready to tap the keg and you see the people standing there with their buckets getting ready to get a bucket of beer and carry back home. Uh, you know, another thing, you know, I'm not I'm not saying they weren't necessarily drinking to get imbibed or get drunk, but, you know, alcohol doesn't spoil. And, uh, you know, sometimes clean water is an issue and, uh, you know, alcohol is, is, you know, by its very nature, sort of keeps some of the stuff from growing in it. I, I don't recommend you drinking alcohol every day in lieu of water, being afraid of the water. But, uh, well, it's according to how that corn liquor was made. Now. True. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you let it ferment itself and don't use yeast, you don't get a headache. Right? Well, one thing you got <laughs> you so. got to go in conjunction with what we're talking about there is the old Tennessee Henry Ford song. Right. Oh, my soldier, the company yeah. store. That was very true in Ducktown yeah. and Copper Hill as well. well, well during that all, there, were, there were company stores, and Rod owned a lot of the stores. Oh, yeah, sure did. Good morning, live on Old Town Cleveland. Hey, uh, Ron. Yeah. I don't have to do the subject or anything, but when you say alcohol, everybody thinks I stay drunk all the time, but I don't. And well, I know you sleep some. Huh? I know you sleep some. Oh, yeah. So you're not drunk then. Well, you may be drunk when you start, but when you wake up, you're sober, right? I, I can't. Well, I, you know, when I, I mean, I can't drink and mix my music. But, uh, yeah, I'll have my beer every once in a while before I eat or something. But uh, it's oh, Arnold Botts down there. No, Arnold Botts is not down here. Oh, I heard you say Arnold. Arnold Tarpley. But anyway, I had a personal question. It might have been a little bit too personal. <laughs> but what? Uh, no, it was. All it was. Whatever happened to Dennis Bennett? 
Uh, Dennis is here in Cleveland now. And uh, I, he's working somewhere, driving a truck, I think. And that's and but I haven't seen him in a while. I hadn't either. I just wondered whatever happened. To him. I, I seen him. I seen him at Scoops and Burgers before they closed up here on uh, uh, Keith Street. And uh, first time I'd seen him in years. Uh, in years. He's pretty good little old drummer, wasn't he? Yeah, well, I played many shows with him back in those days. Uh, anyway, uh, okay, I'll let the guy get back to the subject and. Um, I thought that was Arnold. I remember he he liked Arnold's box. Arnold's box. Is Arnold's box still? Uh, Arnold's, Arnold's here in Cleveland. He works for Jimmy Logan. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. That's right. that's right. Well, thank you, sir. Okay. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Uh, you know, a lot of liquor come back. And you couldn't grow a garden up there, could you? No, you couldn't. No. So there's no nobody grew their own corn to make their own corn liquor. No, they did not. And now maybe up in the mountains, but yeah, not there in the basin. They, but I'm sure they brought that, uh, and you couldn't grow your own tomatoes, right? So I mean, literally, uh, and so, but in uh, in the 20th century, everything was well, there's a lot of company houses, and it, were they paid with scrip? What they call uh, uh, no, the the companies in the basin, even in the 1800s, were paying cash. Um, but the only place you could spend it, it was but don't, well, there just wasn't a lot of merchants, there. right? So right now we've got a. One company that was there for a few years, we think, paid script, and we found record. But the majority of it was cash. Uh, but in the 20th century, you know, you've got private merchants there in addition mm -hmm. to the company store. Mm -hmm. Good morning, live on Old Town Cleveland. Uh, good morning. I would like for you to ask Doug. He knows all about it up there. Whatever happened to Isabel, is it still there? <laughs> Isabel of mine. Huh? Are we talking about the mine or the oh, community? No. That's for the the mine owners. I mean, the mine owners own those homes along there, and they were rented out to the people that worked in the mines. Right, right. Well, the the community of Isabella is still there, uh, and the companies. You know, they owned a lot of housing, but they never owned as much housing as they had employees. So so there were always more people living in private homes than lived in company homes. But uh, the company got out of the housing business in the 1970s, and what they did was they allowed the families living in them right of purchase. And, and you could buy the house if you wanted it. If you didn't, then they put it on the market. Okay. Uh, so a lot of those houses still stand in the communities. They're just in private hands now. Well, let me let me tell you why I'm asking this. I had an uncle that worked in the mines, mm -hmm. and I was up there at the age of 13, and they lived up there, there at Isabella, and there was no country store. It was a slot machine, and he sold liquor out of the store. Mm -hmm. Their name was Mulls, M-U-L-L-S, Mulls. Mm -hmm. Quite a few, quite a few malls still live in the basin. And now that I know uh, the Simons that live there. Right, right. And, uh, well, I was thirteen and I had a good little time up there. Well, uh, you know, I didn't grow up there, but talking to people that did, uh, you know, they, it was a nice community or communities, oh, you know. Right, and one of the things that we forget sometimes, these companies were paying a good wage, oh, especially yeah, for the I South, a high they wage. Made good money. They made good money. They yeah. sure did. His name was Wilburn. Stanley, he, he worked up for years, um, mm -hmm. and uh, let's see now, something else I was going to ask you, oh, you're Doug, are you Doug? No, uh, my name is Ken. Oh, Ken, okay, uh, I just want to let you know that I was up there, and this man on this big flatbed truck, and on there in Isabella, and on Saturday, he would gather us all up, and wanted to go and put sideboards on the truck and take us down to Copper Hill, to the movie zone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, down to the Doordale? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, that, 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 my, that, that age, I wasn't interested in the door. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I just wanted to check base with you, let you know that I did know a little something about it. Well, glad to talk with you. Yeah, and it, it was nice. We had a good time. But those slot machines, you put a quarter in, my aunt would go down there and sit there every night on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> and I got, well, I'd be with her, I'd just visit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Put them quarters in that slot machine. Her quarters, I didn't have any quarters. Okay. <laughs> She's playing with her money. <laughs> well, I won't keep that. We'll let you know I had that experience, too. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Talking about the houses, you know, the, a lot of company houses, and I think uh, Mr. Helton, mm -hmm. I think he came down with you or was down here. Yeah. Uh, 
I think he bought one of those houses. He did. He lived in it for years and years. Mm-hmm. And and did they did they give him a good bargain when they did it? They or? did. Okay. They they had been paid for so many times, yeah. and yeah. at that time they wanted out of the business. So, you know, if if your rent was thirty six dollars a month, the house was thirty six hundred dollars to purchase wow. it. Wow. You know, if it was twenty eight dollars a month, it was twenty eight hundred dollars to purchase it. Uh, but again, they'd been paid for dozens of times over the life of their existence so by that point cd service which was the company of record at that time they just wanted out of the housing business yeah, yeah. so they made it really easy for people to buy yeah. them and get out that that was a good deal mm-hmm. good morning you're live on old town cleveland hey ron hey harold ballard hey harold uh how are you this morning i'm doing great ask your guest there i'm curious uh there's uh so many trucks are going up empty and going in they they cross over the old railroad before you get into Copper Hill, across the railroad there, and make a left and go back in there. And they're hauling something out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they haul it in somewhere down below Moxton Bend, and it's put on a barge. Yep. I was curious to where it goes and what it was. Well, that's a good question, and we're going. Uh, you want to listen, or uh, I'll just hang up and. Okay, listen. yeah, that's a good question. We're going to answer that right now. Okay. Thank you, Harold. Yes, that is a uh, excellent question. The ore in the basin, we've talked a lot about copper, but again, there was more iron sulfide in the ore than any other mineral. And uh, the company would separate that at the mill, and they would put it in what they call the roaster to heat it to get the sulfur off. And they were left with an iron oxide, and it's referred to as calcine. And it's a uh, the iron in the basin is considered low grade. It's not high grade for making steel, but it's good enough to blend with other sources of iron for making steel. And for decades, from the 1920s through the 1960s, they sold it to steel mills around Birmingham, and they would blend it with other sources of iron and go on through and make steel. But by the 1970s, the mills in Alabama began to buy iron from other parts of the country and didn't want our product any longer. So the last 15, 16 years that they were mining, they had no one to buy it. And they began to stockpile the calcine back up in the back of the plant site. Uh, Over 10 million tons were piled up on the surface. And it it lay there through the 80s and 90s and 2000s. And, And about five or six years ago, when the world price for iron went up and scrap iron went up, you know, we start seeing all our junkyards disappearing. Uh, People began to get interested in this product that had been sitting on the surface stockpiled. And uh, so commodities companies have, have came in and they've, they've made contract and purchase agreements with the owners of the plant there in Copper Hill. And they're now selling calcine. And that's what those trucks are hauling. It's a fine reddish brown powder. If you've been behind any of the trucks, you notice their mud flaps are sort of red and the back of their mm. tailgate's red. Uh, they load that on trucks and they haul it to Chattanooga and you're right it's down down on the river below the bend and put it on barges and it goes down the Tennessee to the Tennessee Tom Bigby Canal down to Mobile Bay and goes on boats and I bet you know where it goes from there China Uh, it's being bought and they're doing the same thing with it that Birmingham did they're blending it with other sources of iron for steel manufacture uh it's under contract with the with the Chinese, but they buy it on delivery. So they haven't bought it in, in Copper Hill. They buy it when the boat gets there, but they know it's going to be bought when the boat gets there. And uh, for the last year or so, they've also been hauling about one train out a week. So if you've been into, into the basin, been down to Copper Hill, you see all those hopper cars sitting over in the yard across from the plant. They load about one train a week up of calcine, and it goes to Norfolk, where it goes on boats and goes overseas. Um, and the companies are selling that product, and, and you know, they, they, they take breaks. Sometimes they're not running, mm-hmm. and that has to do with sometimes it's the price of iron. They have a very thin margin, and if the price point's not right, uh, it can also do with availability of boats, because if there's not a boat to sit there and be loaded, uh, so... If you've noticed, sometimes they're running real hard, and then you may not see them run for a week or two, and then they start back up again. But they're selling. It's a product. It's a product that they lost the market for, and it's referred to as calcine, but it's iron. And they're selling it ultimately to uh, companies in China 
and they they uh, use it to make steel that I guess they make into stuff and turn around and sell back to us. How, how long will this stockpile last? Um, you know, I'm not privy to uh, Copper Hill Industries inside information, but I heard from one of their employees that they anticipate at the rate they're moving it that they've got another couple of years to go. They've okay. been running it out for about the last five years or so. Yeah. Yeah, there for a while they had a moratorium running between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., but that's off right now. Well, right? but it will soon go into effect once rafting season okay. starts. So that's just to protect the daytime traffic. Right. I, I, you know, like I say, uh, doing the documentaries along the river up there, uh, those trucks sure do make a lot of noise. Yes, and, they uh, do. And there's some guy on a Harley Davidson I want to kill. Because <laughs> <laughs> I heard him come out of Copper Hill and all the way down to Cleveland. That's how loud he was. And just ruined one whole toll. Total take completely. Good morning, live on Old Town Cleveland. Hey, this is Pappy Lee. Hey, Pappy. Uh, I was wondering uh, uh, what the ratio of uh, immigrant miners was to local uh, miners. Okay, good question. That is a good question. Um, I don't know that I can break it down uh, by numbers, but when the mines opened in 1850, uh, we didn't have in this country a lot of skilled miners. Uh, you know, we had plenty of labor, but we didn't have a lot of skilled miners. So those early companies actually were bringing miners over from Wales, from Cornwall, which uh, the Welsh were, were one of the first people to develop deep shaft mining and to be able to work uh, in shafts. So quite a few Cornishmen came to work in the basin in the 1850s and 60s. Probably upwards of 50 to 70 men were brought in from Cornwall to work in these mines. Well, I was acquainted with uh, I was acquainted with a Greek family that uh, that worked the mines. Of the, the the father of the outfit that worked uh, well, in, in the mines it's from Greece. Yes, and I was going to say, and there were others from other parts of Europe. Captain Rott, uh, Julius Rott, we were talking about. He he immigrated from Germany, so there were there were there other miners coming from other parts of Europe. Uh, the the Cornish were probably the most prevalent, but they were coming from all points in Europe where they had experience in mining. And right. you had another wave of immigrants coming in in the 1890s and the early part of the 20th century. You know, the, the mines closed in 1878 because it, it got too expensive to haul everything in and out by wagon. So the a lot of the skilled miners that were in the basin, they moved on to other parts of the United States where mining was active. You, you can't sit around waiting you know, on a job. So when the right. mines reopened in 1890, you had another wave of immigrants that were coming in to work in the mines. Uh, of course, by that time, they were schools in the United States that were producing mine engineers. So, so they weren't as dependent on getting them in to, to open the mines, but there were still quite a few that were coming from Europe. And, uh, and I'm sure some came from, from Greece. We've got other uh, instances where they were coming from Italy and other parts that, that we've got. I know families in the basin that are descendants of those guys. Uh, right. But by that time, they were probably not making up the majority of the workforce. They were just supplementing it. But, but you know, there were jobs here. And uh, the company also hired uh, – there was a chemist who, who came over from Russia – uh, during the czar and and after the communist overthrew the the czar he didn't want to go back to russia because he was uh he figured he wasn't long for this world and he was granted asylum and worked for the company there in copper hill for another three decades uh no one could pronounce his name the first part was nick so everyone called him uh, mr nick but uh he worked and he was a uh, he was an immigrant from russia who came in to work in the companies well, that's very, very interesting. I'm going to hang up and let somebody else call. Thank you, Pappy. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Pappy's a regular listener and always has some good questions. Talk about the party. I mean, partying or the roughhousing, you know, there there have been murders and people shot sure. in the streets and there was honky-tonks and sure. liquor and was a uh, female companionship available for buy? Well, you almost know there was. Okay. Well, I just had to have you say it. Uh, <laughs> did, was, was, was there any in the early days that was slavery a, a, a big thing or, or, or any slavery? Because, you know, the black population of Polk County has always been rather small. Is that true for Copper Hill area too? It, it is, uh, you know, and this is partly my opinion, partly what we saw in research. You know, the slaves tended to follow agriculture, mm -hmm. and there wasn't a lot of a commercial agriculture in the eastern end of the county, so there wasn't a large black population yeah. in that part of the county. Yeah, I know a lot of Italians brought in to build like Okoye Dam Number mm -hmm. 1, and so right. uh, uh, a lot of immigrants worked on that whole river all the way up through there. Go ahead, caller. Hey, 
Ron, I just wanted to brag on the show. I thought I know a little bit about that, but I don't know, have nowhere near the knowledge that that guy knows about all that. He's about got it figured out, don't he? He's real and telling about that, and you, that's one of the best interesting shows I believe I've ever heard on well, Old Town Cleveland. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, thing. sir. That's yeah. very kind. And uh, oh, I tell you. Uh, I could ask another 200 questions, and we got about 10 minutes left. <laughs> I know it. I could, too. But I thought I'd know something about it, but I don't know nothing dropping a bucket compared to what this guy does. Well, what you need to do is get in your car, go up to the museum up there, and uh, all this is up there. And if you if happen to catch Ken there on the day you're taking your tour, it's just a thrill to because Ken knows more about it than anybody. They're really well, good. Man, I was thinking about riding up there one time. Tell me exactly where that's at, that museum. Go ahead there. One, one time, and then I'll quit bothering you guys. Well, sure. Uh, you know, from Cleveland, you'd, you'd get on 64. You're going to take 64 east there along the Ocoee. And as you get into Ducktown, uh, you know, 64 crosses Highway 68. And you want to turn up on 68 north. And uh, almost immediately after you get on 68 North, the museum entrance is over on the right. Uh, it's just past the county uh, Department of Transportation garage. So you'll see the county DOT garage, and there's a large propane gas company there on the right. They've got a big tank, and you'll see their uh, tank. And then the museum entrance is just beyond the gas company there on the right. Uh, and we're again, we're open Monday through Saturday uh, through the rest of the spring and summer. It's 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Uh, and, I, you know, I, uh, I may know a little bit. There's still a lot I don't know. But uh, we'll, we'll do our best, try to answer any questions you've got when you come up to see us. When you turn off uh, the highway there, it's a little road. Mm -hmm. Go all the way. It snakes around up the hill all the way to the top of the hill. And as soon as you park there, get out and look over the fence, and you'll see the big hole was a part of the borough borough mine right. there then you can go inside the building there five dollars for adults four dollars for seniors yes uh children two, children two dollars or one dollar right depending on the sounds age like, sounds like it would be the most interesting thing anybody that wanted to know the history of that place right, and now where do the locals eat if where's the good place to eat if you come up there if you want to make a day of it go up to the museum drive down and look at the, the sure. train tracks and all that sure. Where's the, where's the locals? Well, at? there's there's two or three places. Uh, there in Ducktown, uh, there's the Copper Kettle Restaurant. Mm -hmm. That's, I've, I've that's been there. good food. Uh, and recently, there in Ducktown, at the uh, at the little uh, video store, uh, they've added a, a deli counter, and they do sandwiches and make pizzas, and they make their own bread and their own crust. It's very good. Uh, Express Video, uh, there in Ducktown. Uh, and then if you go on down into Copper Hill, there's the El Rio, which is a Mexican restaurant, very good mm -hmm. food. And there's a couple of sandwich shops the next block down. Uh, and they're going to be mad at me because the names just escaped. See, I'm not as young as you said I was, Ron. No. Uh, but there's a couple of sandwich shops there on Ocoee Street uh, going through uh, Copper Hill. And uh, they're, it's really good food. And, of course, we've got a couple of chains. There's a Hardee's in Ducktown, and there's a Subway in, in Copper Hill. So if you're if you're afraid to venture out into unknown waters, you can always okay. hit the chain. Uh, Maybe not. If you, you know, go across the river into McKaysville and go down through there, there's a barbecue place up on the hill. There's a barbecue place up on the hill. Well, I like that place. Yeah, and then there's Pat's yeah, Country Kitchen and the Yellow Jacket, both there in mm -hmm. McKaysville that are good food. Now, and if you want, I like the Yellow Jacket myself. Yeah. yeah. The yellow jacket goes way back. Way back. You can go on North 68 and go through Coker Creek. Correct. And mm -hmm. so if you just want to make a day of it, circle through there, go on through Coker Creek. Now I'd eat before you go through Coker Creek. Well, at least make sure you got some gas for you. Yeah, yeah. make way. sure you have gas. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank I'll you. Have to, I'll have to back you up. That would be one of the most interesting, that would be one of the most interesting trips that a body could make to go visit that museum. Yep, sure. Well, come right. see us. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one thing, if I remember correctly, as you go up that driveway, you walk, you actually drive right by where the shafts were to go down into the burr burr. Right, you do. And, and we've got some equipment along the road as well. Yeah, so uh, that, that, when you pull in there, start paying attention right then. Yeah, the, the hoist house is there, which they have events in, right? Right. Um, go ahead, Collar. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Hey, what's going on? It's Ron. Hey, Ron. How are you? Uh, no, this ain't Ron. It's Gerald. Oh, okay, Gerald. This is Ron. Yeah, okay. We got it straight now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, is that uh, Ken you got in there with you? Well, it is Ken. Uh, hey, Ken, it's Gerald. Uh, I come over and hit you every now and then from utilities. 
Oh, okay. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. I just want to call in and say hi to you guys. And you too, Arnold. Uh, I ain't going to leave you out. I just want to say hi to you. <laughs> I, I'm always the afterthought. Hey, I got that telephone number you needed. Hey. Yep. Well, um, let me see. Let me right. We'll, we'll get with hold. I'll get a hold of you next week sometime. Okay. Write my number down right there. That's my cell phone number. Just write it down. Just holler at me. Okay. Let me see if I can read it here. Uh, maybe I, I've got. I know where I get it if I don't have it. I've, I think I have it though. But I, yeah, you asked me for a number for. Uh, I think for Tommy Wildfire Rich. Yeah. I've got it. Yeah, we're having some good shows up in uh, Eastern Tennessee. Uh, that's where I am now. I mean, I ain't moved up there, but mm-hmm. where I go now. We're having some good wrestling matches up there, so if anybody's up in that area, they come and see us up at the National Guard Army. All right, sounds good. So, uh, y'all have a good and enjoy the uh, knowledge, everybody, and I'll talk to you later. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah. All right. He used to be the co-host of Whoop on Wheels here on uh, there, and Big G was his nickname. Uh, murders was there a lot of murders and, and things like that. I, I said there was a deputy sheriff got mm-hmm. uh, ambushed, or a sheriff got ambushed there one mm-hmm. time. Uh, you, know. you know, it's uh, you know, like I said, it was a rough place. Uh, probably not. You know, I'll be honest. I grew up in West Tennessee, and the same kind of stuff went up where oh, I'm well, from. Yeah. I think that just was true of a lot of rural communities well, you know uh, that, uh, these guys who brought that copper down here had to stay overnight yep and they stayed down here at frog town right and frog town had to drink and yep. women of uh adult entertainment i don't know how, how well it, you know there's prostitutes <laughs> there's always you know there's 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 ways of separating men from their money right and uh yeah. that has yeah. not changed and uh, <laughs> mr., and i don't know like i said mr roth was uh I read some things where he got in trouble with some of his partners because he was making so much money on the side too, right. selling things and. Well, uh, yeah, Rot would be, I guess, today what we call vertical integration. <laughs> he he was paid a salary for running the mining companies, but he owned controlling interest in the turnpike company, and he owned a lot of the freight companies that was hauling the goods, and he owned a lot of the farms that were growing the goods and he owned the mills that were producing the wheat and the, and the meal. Yeah. And, uh, so he was making the bulk of his money outside of the mine operations. And at that time, the commissaries, the company stores were on contracts. So the company didn't run them. They would have someone buy the contract mm-hmm. to run the store and Rot ended up buying up those as well. So by the 1870s, Mr. Rott was a millionaire, and well, that's in 1870 dollars that well, he was yeah. a millionaire. And it was considered one of the richest men in Tennessee. Yes, lived right here in Cleveland. So, um, early on, the Cherokees, 1838, basically are moved out of this area. Uh, they're mm-hmm. Cherokees still. You didn't have to leave; you just couldn't live on the land you used to live on. Well, but what was? You were more or less. They wanted you to leave. Yeah, the they ones did. that remained hid out. Right. Because the army came through rounding them up. So you had some that went up into the back reaches of the mountains and escaped the removal. And within a few years, they were able to come back down out of the mountains. But they had forfeited all their property rights. Right. So, uh, and the the Copper Hill area, which wasn't Copper Hill that time. It wasn't Duck Town. It wasn't Turtle Town. It was, we'll get that in just a second. But it was, they were just... You said road uh, uh, footpaths, right? Maybe through there, old hunting paths from the Cherokee or something. Yes, uh, there was no town, there was no body living there. This was rural. I mean, yes. you know, we lived in a rural area, but this was out there. Uh, tell us what the original community was. And of course, we've talked about some people said Duck Town's named after a chief duck. But right. Tell us how some of the Okay. After the removal, it was referred to as the Okoe District, right. and, and land began to be sold off, uh, and a little bit sold along the Okoe River, and particularly the McKay family had bought some land there okay. in what's now Copper Hill. Right. And this was, became Bradley and McMinn County. Right. right. Well, at that time, it was still considered the Okoe District, right. which made up part of what today is Polk, Monroe, McMinn, and Bradley counties. Right. Uh, those counties, uh, Bradley existed, but they added a little more to it out of that district Um, when the first mine opened in 1850 it was called the Hiawassee mine and it was there in what is now Ducktown and the town began to be called Hiawassee town the the region began to be called the Ducktown basin and that's where the name of the museum comes from 
Uh, that's the historic name. What we call Copper Basin today in the 1800s was referred to as the Ducktown Basin or the Ducktown District. And in geology circles, it's still referred to as the Ducktown Basin or Ducktown District. So that's where the name of the museum comes from. Not that we're in Ducktown, but that's the historic name for the region. Um, there was no Chief Ducky. Well, there. if he existed, he left. He didn't leave his mark. Uh, he doesn't show up in any of the censuses, and these were done back to colonial days, and he's not in any of the Cherokee oral histories. Uh, there was a village, though, that was called Kawane, which roughly translates to Place of the Duck. And that's where the name Ducktown comes from. Same thing from. with Turtle, right? Same thing with Turtle Town. It was Shaloa. But if you look at the early censuses from colonial days, it will say Kawane or Kawane Village, and then underneath, Ducktown. Uh, it's English translation for a Cherokee word. And then there was the McKay's? The McKay's family, and the town was called McKay's, and then later changed to Copper Hill. And then McKaysville, right across the river. McKaysville, right across the river, used to be called Hawkinstown, and then later became to be called McKaysville. Yeah. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. That's me again. Yeah. Uh, I got one question. I'm going to get off here. All right. All right. All them wagons and stuff that used to go up and down through there, did they never get robbed or anything? I mean... Yes, they did, and that was a rough area, and uh, and what we would refer to today or back then was highwaymen and, and robbers. There was quite a bit of theft and quite a bit of bushwhacking and robbing that went along the road, and in fact, the, the story is, and, and like a lot of stories, we can't 100% document it, but when the payroll would have to come up from Cleveland to the basin to pay the miners, because these guys were paid in cash, uh, the story is that that they sent a wagon up with a lockbox on it that was empty and some distance behind it rot would follow in his in his hack or buggy that had a false bottom built into it that he actually had the payroll in it but he sent a decoy out in front for the robbers to attack and you know they were shotgun riders and people had to mm -hmm. go along with them to protect that so yes uh but that road was also a, a toll road and a turnpike road, so those companies tried to patrol it as best they could. But, you know, it was a different time. Robbery was, was probably not a daily occurrence, but it was probably a daily threat. And before 1910, that the road that we travel today, that's up on the side of the hill. The road was down by the river. I mean, parts of it might be the same, but... You know, when you get down far, yeah. it was actually way more down, right. and it's under the lake. Now. Mostly along the river, yeah. yes. Okay, I appreciate that. See you. Thank you. Well, folks, that's been uh, two hours really darn quick. Uh, you got sure any final, final words? Well, you know, we've we've just touched on so little of the whole oh, story. I know. It's just so and great. I would just encourage everyone to come to the museum or visit our website, Ducktown Basin Museum, all one word. If com. somebody yes. wanted to read one book that tells you about this, is there one great book? Well, for the early period, for uh -huh. the 1800s, it's called Ducktown back in Rott's time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was written by a gentleman named uh, Robert E. Barkley, R.E. Barkley. Uh, I know they have it at Cleveland Public Library. I'm sure it's over probably at the History Branch. Uh, and that is, you know, we, we oftentimes will go according to Barkley when, we're, when yeah. we're doing research on the basin. If you're talking about the, the development of the mines, the opening of mines from the 1840s, through the 1870s, that is the source. And mm -hmm. I, I have a copy of that book myself in my library. Yes. Uh, before you get off here, there's any events going on this summer that some people might be interested Let's in. Let's get this call here. Good morning. You're live on Old Town Cleveland. Hey, Ron. Hey. This is Ina. Yeah. Hey, before you go off there, uh, won't you play something for the family of Toby McKenzie? I'm going to find a song for him here that uh, is, I'm going to play the song uh, Gone Home. It's an old uh, bluegrass tune that I usually play for friends. I, I've been mean to mention that. Tobin Kinsey, I grew up uh, right down the street from him, and we played ball together. I got great stories about it. And Tobin's a good friend, and we, he will be missed. Oh, yeah, he'll be missed by a lot of us. Yeah, I'll, I'll play a song for him. Uh, it's called Gone Home, and uh, it'll be a couple of songs in, but I'll get to it. Okay, buddy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for asking that question, Arnold. Uh staff would have got on to me if i'd neglected <laughs> this uh we've actually got an event coming up on june 1st uh the first saturday in june it's an annual event it's a kids carnival 
and uh, it's a fundraiser for the museum but we have uh, sponsors that underwrite the cost of the carnival it's it's geared for for small children let's say 12 and under uh-huh. uh but the, everything's free for the kids the games are free uh, the concessions are free we'll have hot dogs and popcorn and drinks uh your traditional small little carnival games you know uh, knocking down the pins or throwing the ball through the hole uh prizes available and we have a cakewalk and bingo for the adults to uh they're a dollar throw for them to do uh, and all of this is to raise money for the museum but it'll be in the hoist house hoist from 10 a.m to 2 p.m that first saturday in june um uh, and uh you know it's a it's a fun event uh, and it's an easy event for families and and everyone can come out and enjoy it regardless of of you know money and uh so we have that coming up next and then every year Around the 4th, we have what's called Miner's Homecoming there in Ducktown. Right. And we always do it on the weekend. So some years we're before the 4th, some years we're after. This year we'll we'll be after. It's Friday, July 5th, and Saturday, July 6th. Uh, Events will start that afternoon again at the Hoist House. But there will be events taking place in town and up at the Mason's Lodge and and at the school. So there's, there's all type of activities that go on those two days. Uh, and that's an annual event where a lot of the families that, that no longer live in the basin come back that weekend. And uh, there's a company reunion for the past employees of the companies that get together. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, <clears throat> don't forget to call Old Town Cleveland on Saturday mornings and remind us about that the week before and the, that morning. And I will. Because uh, we're always trying to find places sure. for things to do. Arnold, you got any closing comments? No. Uh, talking to Doug and Keith and everything, I knew about those events coming up. I want to make sure we got them mentioned. And I'll try to get, when they get the flowers and everything together, I'll try to get them down here for Ron and them to be sure to mention it a few times before then, too. Thank you. Thank you. 35 years the museum has been there. Yes. Uh, Like I say, if the hoist house is, if you're going up to the top of the the museum, the hoist house is on your left about halfway up. Right. Right. So it's it's a big building there. You can't really miss that. We'll have an event uh, this fall to celebrate that 35th uh, anniversary of the date and everything's still getting finalized but we're, we're probably looking at uh september but uh, i'll get you that information as well got a great little bookstore there too we do we have a small gift shop with a lot of area books uh things on the on Good. the region from from or into north carolina down to uh, cleveland chattanooga try to cover the region with the uh, books and then we have some uh some uh, mineral specimens and and jewelry items as well yeah. You also have Caney Creek we going do. home. Deep. Well, we you do. did have. I think you almost sold out. Well, but I'm hoping to restock. I think you can restock. I think yes. we can arrange that. Uh, I'll tell and, Deb when she gets back in town here. And it's up else, too. Got to say congratulations to you and your family for the work you've done on the Caney Creek and the award it won and the award for this show. Right. Old Town Recognizing Old Town you for so has, that's good. Uh, as one as a history show great in service media. You're providing. And then uh, the documentary won the award of distinction in East Tennessee. So it's a award winning documentary now. So uh, uh, very great. And there's some other places it's going to be played. Uh, the museum here on uh, the 9th, uh, come out and see it. Uh, and the, uh, the award will actually be presented. Uh, Thursday night here, uh, May 9th here in Cleveland at 630. The people from East Tennessee uh, Historical Society is coming down. Well, folks, that's been Old Town Cleveland. We really run long here today. I want to mention, as always, go get those pictures from out from under the bed and out of the closet and out of the drawers. And, and like uh, Arnold brought a picture of his uh, grandfather who worked in the mines up here today, which is just great photos. I love those old things. You never know who you're a picture of your grandfather who worked with him or a picture of an old store will always know what happened at Pearl Harbor, but will we know what happened in your family and down your street. It's up to you next week, folks. It's Lake Winnipesoka. Uh, and if you can spell it, you're better than I am folks. <laughs> we'll see you next week here on Old Town Cleveland. You are listening to W O O P L P Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Oh,
Check into, check into cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the match. Check into